Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 727. That is 727 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your lovely host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered. Had a bit of a run in the morning, heading off to the gym later, but today's a free day, so I thought, why not record the pod, share some of my thoughts with you, and let you know, wah, guan, in the world of culture. You know how it is, you know how it is. So, for the longest time, I've been thinking about some face modifications, right? Some face modifications. Some of you eagle-eyed people out there who may have seen some of my piercings will know that I used to have two piercings on my nose. One on the left side, one on the right side. Unfortunately, like an idiot, when I first got my piercings, I got the left one first and the right one second. So unfortunately, when I did go get my right one done, the right one wasn't aligned. And because I'm a little bit of an OCD freak, because I've got artistic tendencies, because I'm a stickler for symmetry, every time I was watching myself in a camera or every time I took a selfie, I couldn't not not see or not not noticed that the right one was a bit lower than the left one. I'm not sure if you have, anybody else might have noticed it, but I know I noticed it and I couldn't handle it. So over a period of time, because I kept staring myself in the camera from doing my content I do and from taking various selfies with the duck lips, when I'm out and about and shit, I thought, you know what? I can't be doing this double piercing. Well, I have to take out one. So I took out the right one because I quite like where the left placement is. So now I'm thinking maybe tomorrow or Friday, I need to go into central London to the place where I went to go get it done the first time. I actually kind of forgot the, the actual name of the tattoo parlor, but it was a little trendy tattoo parlor somewhere in central London that also does piercings and stuff and go down there and get them to align it so that both piercings are the same. Hopefully... What they'll end up doing is they'll end up probably taking off the piercing so they can see where the actual piercing is in my skin and then kind of line it up and then show me because when I got it done the last time, I think I got done, the left one was done in London and then the right one was done in Madrid when I went um, for a weekend. And the, the, the piercing shop that I went to in Madrid is really popular. It's really cheap as well. And they were literally, you know, they had a queue outside of this guy's room. who was piercing everybody. Like people, girls were coming in to get their belly buttons pierced, whatever, nipples, everything, right? It's just like, it was churning them out. So I didn't really have a time to go back and forth, you know, and be like, oh, I want it here. I want it there. So when I went in there, he just like popped it through and then I was kind of gone. And by the time I realized it was obviously not sent, it wasn't um, aligned. There wasn't any symmetry in it. So when I go get my piercing done, I have to go and figure out a way of getting them to have it aligned so that both piercings sit exactly where they should be there because I just couldn't handle it how it was. And I, I left it in there for a while because I liked the look. But now that I'm thinking of getting the piercings, because I've got these balls, right? These little balls, right? Um, on, the, on my nose. But I'm thinking now of having these little tiny spiked cones. But if I get the spiked cones, they're only going to look good if they're actually aligned. So I have to get them aligned. Hopefully get them done by the end of the week. So if you're going to see a mod, you'll see that. You also might see me get my hair braided by the end of the week also. That's something I'm, I'm going to look forward to do. I'm tired and bored of doing it because I'm such a flipping... I wouldn't say I'm lazy... But um, I usually don't really put a lot of time into stuff like that, you know, like, because I don't think I'm lazy. I do a lot of things. So I'm not lazy, lazy, but I am lazy in terms of go get my hair done, go get it braided. I have to fucking comb it all out. I have to go book myself at the fling. I got to be there for an hour and a half. Like it's a whole fucking day or half a day of fucking things to do. And, you know, God forbid I, I don't put any fucking extensions or shit in my hair anyway, but I can only imagine what that's like for other black girls. But the braiding thing is annoying because I have to go get all that stuff done. Anyway, that aside, first world problems aside, I saw this picture of Drake and I thought to myself, I'm, I've am i now got an excuse to do this because I've been thinking about it for a while. Right? I've been thinking, I want to get a face tat. I don't have any other tattoos, right? None. I don't have a single tattoo on my body. But I want to get two tattoos straight away, right? I want to get a face tat and I want to get a tattoo on my on the top of my hands. And the top of my hands one is going to be really naff. You guys are going to cringe when you hear this. You know what I want to get on the top of my hands? On one side, I want to get A. On the, <laughs> what, on the other side, I want to get a Z. So right is A, left is Z. Guess what that spells? A-Z. 
that's what I want to get. I wanted to get that for a while, right? And I want to get it in a nice, like, gothic print font. Maybe outline only. I probably won't fill it. Just a nice outline only, right? Um, On the fucking, you know, top side of my hands. But then the other thing I was thinking of getting, now that I've seen Drake and his tattoo, was a face tattoo. I'm thinking of getting a face tattoo. I wanted one for a while too. I want to get this really naff idea where I get the, where I get the, what do you call it? um The crescent half moon and then a the sun at the back of my ear. So the whole idea behind it is from that Lanty Faux lyric of like, you know, sun in front, moon behind, you know, almost like, you know, can't kind of uh, representation of my lifestyle. <laughs> right. That's the deep meaning of this fucking cringy, corny tattoo. But if Drake can get it and he's old and washed, why can't I get it? Huh? If Drake can get it and he's old and washed, why can't I get it? Now, there's a lot separating, you know, me and Drake, right? His bank account, <laughs> his success, <laughs> his light skinness, right? His attractiveness. There's a lot of things separating me and Drake, right? But I think if he can get a face tattoo at his big age, why can't I get a little face tattoo? A little half crescent moon just underneath my eye here. So from afar, it'll look like a... T so it'll, be, it'll serve two purposes. It'll be really trendy and hipstery, right? And all the fucking, you know, all the white girls in the scene will fucking... Their panties will fucking get wet when they see me. Um, all the Asian girls will think I'm fucking hardcore. All the black girls will think I'm a little bit dangerous, right? So it'll be good for the ladies, right? They'll all get their fucking mops out for me. So, but from afar, from the fellas, it'll look like a teardrop because it's a tattoo underneath the eye, right? Just underneath the eye here. It'll be a little half moon, a little half crescent here, right? A little, little tiny little sketch. You know how the girls get a little triangle on the back of their heels, on their ankle or something, right? Or that little paper airplane. It'll be that size, really, really tiny. And then I want the sun um, thing. It'll be basically like how the emojis are. You know the emojis that you have with the moon? You'll be at the little moon face with the, with the eyes going to the, going to the right. You know, that little, that, that little moon emoji will be here and then I'll get the sun right there on the back of my neck. That's what I'm thinking of doing. That's what I'm thinking of doing. Now, it's really R-worded, right? It's really redacted. I understand. It's really corny, really lame. The time has gone by and to get two first, you know, tattoos ever on your body, on your hands and on your face is a bit crazy, but you know me. I'm crazy, right? Look at me. I'm the crazy boy. Ooh, look. Weird. Cookie. I've got a flask on top of my head. Right? I'm that guy. So that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm doing going forward. I cannot wait to do it. So that's the kind of plan. And since I've seen Drake with his new tattoo that he's got, which says, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's, some, it's, it's like an Arabic phrase, right? It's some sort of um, Toronto slang. It's called miskeen. What does it mean again? On Google, it says above his eyebrow, the word translates to poor or pathetic. But I think it's like, a, I don't know what the slang is. Maybe it means the opposite thing. Like I'm miskeen, like, you know, I'm on some madness. I don't know. But it's some sort of Toronto slang or something. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Poor, unfortunate. It's like a slang word, isn't it? Literally means poor. People use it as urban fashion, miskeen originals to talk about miskeen. So let's see. Well, it says an urban dictionary. What a miskeen child. Wow, did you see that miss that Mike Lotteris was wearing? He's so miskeen. A person who claims to be in a gang is really just a suburban civilian. So maybe that's what Drake is doing. It's sort of like a double entendre. Uh, miskeen is literally poor in Arabic. Okay, whatever it means. Whatever it means, he's inspired me to get my tattoo. And like I said, I want to get, I want to get like a hot, what do I get? I want to get like a, um, half moon illustration. A really small, so something like that, really small under my eye, like that. You see this? Something really, 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 really small under my eye, that. And then I want to get the sun. Uh, let me see. Whoops. So I want to get the half moon illustration, right? You saw that, right? Half moon illustration. And then I want to get the sun. Sun illustration. Whoops. Come on. Yeah, like that. So that that's what I'm thinking of doing on my face. Maybe maybe something like that though. Maybe that kind of, you know, uh maybe one of those sort of like Asian inspired ones might do well. But yeah, that's what I'm looking to do. So soon you'll see me with hand tattoos, face tattoos, braids, two pieces of my nose. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, and some vibes. <laughs>
<laughs> and some vibes, man. <laughs> it's going to be so fucking funny. It's going to be so hilarious. I'm just going to pop out. And obviously, with my Turkish teeth, I'm just going to pop out like nothing happened. Like, what? What's wrong? Just with my two Turkish teeth, right? My two rows of fucking pristine chompers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, my little face tattoo. It's going to be an absolute madness. It's going to be a madness. Anyway, moving on from that one, I want to quickly touch upon the Diddy and Cassie stuff again. And mostly, just wanting to speak about it because I think this has been a little bit of an educational moment or a, an eye-opening moment for me in terms of how I navigate in my little scene of dance music and stuff, right? Because that's really the only place I'm out and about meeting other people and whatnot. Because most time, for the most part, I usually keep to myself to myself. But when I'm out and about in these clubs and stuff, I've always had this really weird, fanciful idea that clubs, you know, they're not really safe spaces, but if anything, they're our attempt at creating a quasi or faux utopia right? It's sort of like our, um, you know, our view on what society should look like in that brief kind of time period, right? Where we all get along. We don't talk about politics. We're just here for a good time. We're just here for a, a good time, not a long time, all that good shit, right? But one thing I think has really been unfortunate that I've seen happen in the last few years is that there's been a lot of that kind of like, um, I wouldn't even call it bro culture, but there's a lot of that hookup culture thing has become a little bit more Pressed has become too much in the forefront so similar to the drugs and booze i feel like the drugs and booze thing has become way more of a priority for people when they go out as opposed to the music meeting new people having a dance letting yourself go a bit you know what i mean from the hardness of your week and maybe the rigidity of your life of your of your life at home or whatever it may be maybe able to go out once a month once whenever you go out and just kind of let go is really important for all humans to do doesn't matter if you do it in a club doesn't matter if your your release is going to a park is going to a, is you know going to do the fucking weekly shopping you need a release and i think clubs serve as that release but i think with the with people prioritizing hookups and fucking and shit and drinking and doing drugs in clubs more so than the music, there's been a lot of blurring of the lines, right? People just basically being a little bit too comfortable when it comes to the females with the women in these spaces and really making it not the most comfortable spaces for them to go to, which really does explain, especially in London, why loads of girls prefer to go to gay nights because they feel way more comfortable there. They feel um, less like they have to be, you know, on attention all the time and they can really enjoy themselves wear what they want do what they want without the threat of some guy trying to come up behind them grind on them touch them talk to them all this sort of nonsense so i think this diddy and cassie thing for me was a reminder on what is important and the important thing is to look after one another to really look after one another and call out the fuck shit no matter who it is no matter what they do, no matter their station, no matter their money, no matter anything, you have to call it out because the only way these things, these kind of predators and these abusers can stop or the only way we can kind of limit, um, you know, the amount of victims or their damage that they do to people is if we call this shit out. Regular people, you and I, regular civilians, punters, customers, ravers, whatever it may be, whatever industry, whatever niche, whatever subculture that we're involved in, you have to call out the fuck shit. Because if you don't call out the fuck shit, people will go getting, you know, people will get abused, people will get taken advantage of behind the scenes, you know, until the end of time because people aren't willing to step up. And you have to also keep in mind, with this Cassie and, and Diddy thing, Cassie is quite high profile too. That's probably one of the reasons why it got the amount of coverage that it did and why it was such a slam dunk case. Because she's quite high profile, because she was close to Diddy for a number of years, right? Nobody can deny that she was, you know, a close confidant of his and they spent a lot of personal time together. So whatever account or whatever experience that she has um, of the time that they had together, you would be remiss to say that she was lying because she was there. We saw her with him all the time. You know, he spoke about it all the time. They spoke about each other all the time. So clearly there's a lot of weight in it. And plus, she's a bit of a legend in her own right when it comes to the music and when it comes to just being a face and whatever it may be. So I think it's honestly really, really important for people like myself included to really put that at the forefront. And I'm also going into the new year with my raving mindset or my new kind of outlook on why I'm trying to approach things. I'm on a fun vibe. I'm on just a kind of, you know, dance. 
I'm on to let free because again, I'm not really going out as often as I was before. Maybe once a month, maybe twice. But when I am going out, it's phone in pocket vibes. No scrolling on the social media. No fucking loitering around the edges. Going right in the middle, dancing my fucking face off, having a good time, helping and you know supporting everybody around me. If somebody looks like they're about to go a bit crazy or loopy, whatever, helping them out with some water, making sure everybody's okay. If I've got a spare you know, giving somebody something here, enjoy yourself, have a good time, be responsible and just looking after people around you without any, any idea of any intention or any kind of um, entitlement. Oh, I want to hook up with somebody. Obviously that's not me anyway. I'm married. I've got children and shit. I'm not going to be in that vibe, but still this idea of going to these sort of places with the intention of seeking somebody to go and attack is not on personally i i don't think so and i think even when i wasn't married right what i did when i did go out and i had occasions where i did happen to fucking get lucky on a dance floor for the most part it happens to you you don't have to go looking for it if somebody sees you and they like the 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 fucking cut of your fade they like how your chin sits they like how your eyes are or your the way your hands move most likely they'll come up to you anyway so you don't need to go out there hunting like a fucking you know like a like a man out there in a safari or something no you need to just chill enjoy yourself have a drink and relax and you see someone doing some crazy shit some creepy shit you have to call that shit out because look at this story the latest update here right that i've seen regarding cassie and diddy diddy reportedly pressured cassie to get breast implants then demanded she remove them the next day despite health risks because they were too big can you imagine the level of control the level of manipulation this guy had on this young lady. Absolutely wild. And you also start to think, I said before, imagine how unlucky Cassie is to come into the industry and the first prominent person that she meets, her first long-time collaborator, the person that basically makes her career, is fucking Diddy. Of all the people she could have bumped into, she had to bump into fucking Diddy. Fucking hell, man. So there's a lot of good that came from it, but the fucking negatives probably outweigh the positive probably if you think about it because she hasn't she hasn't released any music since maybe that's the reason why she hasn't put any music the music industry has been so tainted because of her time in it that she wants absolutely nothing to do with that previous life like i said this there's something quite interesting about how quickly she stepped away from the scene she her and diddy broke up and you haven't seen her in a hip-hop space ever again even her husband is fucking white do you know I mean? She completely went the opposite way. Like, I don't want anything to do with that scene. Get fucked. So I wonder if that's to do with the treatment that she kind of endured from Diddy. So again, she had a she had a decent enough career, but then now she's probably been scarred for life when it comes to music and doesn't want anything to do with it because every time she probably thinks about music, she thinks about fucking Diddy. Um, it's, the article says, Diddy and Cassie may have agreed on a settlement to prevent more details of their alleged abuse from becoming public. But now that Cassie's truth is out there, more people are stepping forward to come uh, to back up her claims and more. A witness who was around when Cassie got a breast augmentation back in 2009 has come forward to reveal the level of control that Diddy had when it came to Cassie's body. According to the source, Diddy was unhappy with the breast augmentation he pressured Cassie into getting and demanded the celebrity plastic surgeon, Dr. Frank Ryan, remove just one remove it just one day after one day after and again i don't know much about breast implants or augmentation but i would imagine you just can't remove them the day after there's a lot of aftercare that goes into making sure those things sit right and whatnot I've, I'm, I'm sure of it the quote courtesy of the daily mail speaking of exclusive to the daily mail did he thought that he could go back right into surgery like now and take them out and dr ryan was like no way trying to explain it to him that he would have to wait at least six months to see how it heals because she was just opened up. But Diddy was like, no, they've got to come out. Call you who you need to call. They've got to come out. The witness who spoke on the condition of anonymity said the discussion took place shortly after Thanksgiving 2009 at the office of Dr. Ryan, who died the following year in August 2010 when he accidentally dove off a cliff in Malibu while sending a text. <laughs> Fucking hell. This plastic surgeon died by accident because he drove off a cliff. That's he must have he must have self-expired, isn't it? How can you accidentally drive off a cliff? Fucking hell. Inside source um said she did not speak at the time to avoid causing problems. And I also understand the detail that they have on these allegations around Diddy and Cassie makes you, you know, it leads you to believe that most likely everything they say about him is true. 
because nobody so far has come out and refuted the claims. Nobody has close to the idea said, no, actually, these claims are, uns are you know, they're not, substanti they're not substantiated. This, this guy was a good guy. He did nothing bad to me, blah, 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 blah. Nobody has come out to back him up, right? And you would think for the amount of people that he's intimidated, the amount of people he's helped over the years, there'd be at least one person willing to go on record and say, nah, this is a good guy. No one of any re repute anywhere of any kind of worth. You know, you know, there's obviously the slim thugs of rich dollars and all those kind of donkeys um, have come out and disputed Cassie's claims. But that's more so on the kind of alpha male manosphere type of defense, right? Oh, it's why, she didn't, why didn't she file the complaint when it happened? All that sort of nonsense. But you haven't heard anybody in the industry actually try to... Um, back up diddy's character right or basically say hey no he's not the guy that he's being portrayed to be no one really have any repute and these details the level of detail the dates included the people included it's making me believe that everything that cassie said was absolutely true it continues um but that calculus changed um last thursday when cassie whose real name is cassie ventura filed the bombshell lawsuit the singer da, 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 I thought Cassie would ne would never come forward to talk about this. When she finally did yesterday, I was like, thank God. I'm so happy that she has the courage to do what she was doing. And I was more happy to come forward myself to describe the level of abuse that I saw was she was enduring. And this is what this is the benefit of people coming forward, even after the fact, even if it isn't a civil case, just to get some money. Because what it does is that it exposes people. And I think that's the major, most important part of this. Because the truth of it, the ugly truth of it, the ugly, ugly truth of it, is that people like Diddy don't go to prison. People of this type of level of wealth, he's the one, you know, he's one of what? Only f a handful of billionaires in hip hop, maybe a handful of, you know, black billionaires in the world, right? People like this don't go to prison. They don't go to jail. They won't face any real life consequences apart from reputational damage. But reputational damage is everything to these people because they spend a long time building their reputation. They spend a long time working, cultivating, doing deals, scamming, um, you know, stepping on people, whatever they do to, to make the reputation be what it is. So when somebody comes out with the allegation, even if it's one, even if it's two, it can undo a decade, two decades worth of work in an instant. So Cassie doing what she did, being brave and stepping up and talking about it and putting it on paper, putting it via the courts has done more damage to his legacy than probably anything before this, than any innuendo, than any rumor or whatever. The fact that somebody close to him, the fact that somebody that we all saw that was close to him throughout the years coming out and say what she said, and then the, res and then the what you call it, the settlement happening soon after, even though the lawyer is saying it's not an admission of guilt, I'm sorry. To us regular people, it does look like an admission of guilt. If you're innocent of the crime that Diddy's been accused of as a man, I've said it plenty of times myself, if that ever was to occur to me, which it wouldn't because I'm not a fucking creep, right? I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a fucking creep and I'm not going to, you know, put myself on people when they don't want me to put on them. No way, Jose. But if an allegation like that was to ever come on my name, no pun intended, there is not a day that wouldn't go by while I'll not be defending myself. I would exhaust every single option to clear my name if I didn't do it. No matter what people said, I would ex I would exhaust every option. And then I know, fundamentally, I, know, I think all men know, even if you do clear your name, that smut of being accused of being a rapist and abuser can never really leave you anyway. That little bit of a smudge on your name can never leave you. It's kind of a lesson you have to kind of take. It's one of those harsh, harsh lessons in life you have to take, even if you, you're completely innocent and you have to kind of keep it moving. But... I will try my best to clear my name, regardless if I know some people won't believe me because, you know, when someone puts out the allegations, people immediately think, oh, because you've been accused, you must be guilty. I would not, not settle any way, shape or form. It doesn't matter what a lawyer said, what my counsel said, not happening. So the fact that Diddy did it, given his station, given his resources, given his clout, given his fame, tells me everything. It tells you everything that he will do at this time. It tells you absolutely everything. Honestly, it really does. It continues here. Um, I've always been traumatized myself about what I saw. To me, watching this was just cruel, so horrible. She was treated like a rat. It was literally like her voice was snatched and there was nothing she could do. That she was started standing up for herself. She was in trouble. She knew to keep quiet and go along with whatever she was, whatever he's saying. And that's something that you also have to kind of keep in mind. Again, this is all kind of revisionist history. But even looking back, being a bit of an R&B, um, you know, pop head myself, whatever it may be that she was the creator at that time, right? whatever that genre is, but I'm going to call it mostly R&B. 
if you think back to Cassie, she really was a bit of a an empty vessel, in it? She didn't really speak much, not many interviews, and she really didn't go out of her way to kind of express herself or really have a her have her voice heard in any way, shape, or form. That maybe is an explanation as to why. Because of all the years of abuse and control, she was made to feel like she didn't really have a voice, you know? And that probably explains why she was so quiet and why she did, you know, take a bit of a back seat and let basically Diddy take all the shine or just was there to be a fucking glorified handbag of some regard, right? Or maybe a trophy wife in that regard. It's really interesting when you think about all these things, it's all like piece together her kind of personality and shit. Um, it continues. Uh, the the. Blah, blah, blah. He presented his vision for Cassie's breasts as she stood topless before them and had photos taken of her body. It was him taking it was him talking about what he wanted to the surgeon, by the way. Imagine how weird that is, bro. God almighty. If you're a surgeon and you see a dude in your room or in your fucking, you know, consultation room telling you how he wants his wife's or the lady in question's breast to look, most likely you should probably put a call into somebody, right? Because most likely there's some abuse or some level of manipulation and control, whether it's, you know, physical or psychological going on behind the scenes. If a guy comes into your fucking, you know, surgery place and is like, hey, I want my breast, I want my lady to look like this and shows you a picture of Nicki Minaj, like, there's some issues there. If the, Especially if the woman's not talking and she's standing behind the dude the whole entire time. It's a bit odd. Looking down the floor, like twiddling her thumbs. Really strange. Um... She had a flat chest. He said he wanted a full shape, sexy, but not too big. Usually men act like I just want her to be happy, even though they know it's for them. Men are usually kind of quiet in these consultations. It was out of the ordinary that he was doing all of this talking and she wasn't saying anything. She appeared meek. She was more like a Stepford wife, agreeable and amiable, but quiet. God damn. Um, he just got into his artistry mode, the witness said, recalled the surgery, charged about 16 grand for the for the procedure. I bet you that's gone up now, isn't it? I bet you that's nowhere near the price of breast augmentation now. That was 16K in what? That was in 2006, they said, right? I bet you that is probably doubled by now uh, because everybody's getting work done. Because I remember back then, even women that did get, you know, I don't know, uh, that got fucking, you know, touch-ups and shit, right? They got stuff kind of pulled and tightened, whatever. It was such a big deal. Do you remember that, how big of a deal that was? When a woman got a fucking, her boobs done, the stories everywhere, front page news, everyone talking about it. It's like, Jesus Christ. And now people get their whole entire faces changed, bodies changed, and people don't really bat an eyelid, really. Um, it continues. He was describing how great the outcome is going to be, how confident he was about achieving the desired results. The surgery took place later in the week in another location with Cassie being released in the evening. But according to a source, Diddy was furious with the results. The very next day, he wanted to meet Dr. Ryan and discuss having a breast removed to be a smaller size. Dr. Ryan called the witness, expressing alarm and wanting her to be present for the meeting. He wanted me to be there. He needed some support. He um, thought that there would be a strength in numbers with me helping navigate through this. So most likely Diddy will know who this person is, isn't it? They're being anonymous on the paper, but most likely Diddy will know who that person is. He'll definitely remember. Um, this is a bit too bait, man. During this visit, Cassie quietly sobbed as Diddy railroaded the surgeon, as source says. It was the day after the surgery. She looked like she was in a lot of pain. The plastic surgeon tried to talk sense to Diddy, she said. The doctor was shocked and seemed like he was going to piss his pants um like what am i doing with this the source said he was trying to hold his ground that he was never going to happen assuring him that we were that 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 was that assuring him that we can get to that desired result but that we need some time for healing he was saying that he was he was saying there's a lot of swelling now but that is how it will go down he said you're seeing a lot of swelling and a lot of fluid but it will go down but then he wasn't convinced and kept saying no they've got to come out now Dr. Ryan succumbed to the pressure. Okay, I'll get them together. We'll take them out, do a smaller size. Jesus Christ. He felt bad for her. It was sad. It was just sad. And while this was all going on, Cassie was not talking at all. She was crying, visibly traumatized, but she wasn't saying anything at all and just going along with whatever was said. She, was advocate she wasn't advocating for herself or for the boobs and Diddy was not comforting her at all. Privately, Dr. Ryan told me this was a um, mutilation that I can't even believe this, a witness said. He was saying, poor Cassie, this is awful. The source said the doctor rushed to get the supplies and team together and performed the follow-up surgery within a week. A witness said that he'd never see Diddy or Cassie again. She kept silent until now. 
Oh, fucking hell, bro. Absolutely crazy, bro. Absolutely crazy. I bet those plastic surgeons have seen some things, innit? And they have to really question their morality as well, their principles, if they're willing to do that, you know, for money and stuff. It's like, fucking hell, bro. You know, you are also aiding and abetting the mutilation, especially so soon after the job has been done, the first one. But I guess you have to pay for your family, innit? You got to pay for your mortgages and put your kids through private school. So I guess nothing really matters. Fucking tragic, man. But yeah, strength and solidarity to Cassie. Um, and yeah, guys in the fucking on the fucking dance floor need to keep their hands, eyes and ears to themselves and just dance, have a good time and not turn every fucking nightclub, you know, outing into an opportunity to go and bang and try and pull. It's not that deep, really. Go for the music, dance, have a good time and go home. That really is should be the name of the game, in my opinion. But again, what do I know? Moving on, we've got this really concerning story regarding ASAP Rocky having to face trial for firing a gun at a childhood friend. This might be one of the most redacted stories I've ever seen in my entire life because it only happened two years ago. And if you guys know, obviously Rocky is fucking basically married to Rihanna. They have two kids. There's rumors that they might be having a third. She's obviously a legit billionaire with businesses coming out of every orifice, every surface on her body. Just recently, she signed a big deal with Puma. And because of her clout and her notoriety, she re-signed with Puma. Sorry, not a big deal, but she re-signed with Puma with a new deal. She was even able to get fucking rocky a deal with puma to do some formula one connection it's absolutely terrible don't get me wrong but she still has enough clout enough influence enough riches enough power to get her fucking baby daddy her husband a deal with puma so they're all set right they're set for life rocky gets to perform at all these cool festivals around the world in europe still asap rocky is super popular here maybe not so much in the states but in europe asap rocky kills it Every festival, prominent one in the UK, books him from Primavera to fucking Wireless here in the UK to Reading and stuff like every other festival I see in Europe, like Alternative, whatever festival it may be, they love booking fucking ASAP Rocky. So he's always paid. He's always booked and busy, even though he doesn't drop albums and singles too often. He's nice. And obviously he's married to a fucking legit billionaire. If that's the case, why are you shooting people, did Rocky? Why do you even own a fucking gun? Why are you getting in altercations where you're having to fucking shoot somebody in the first place? Even more so with it being an old childhood friend, right? The former, if I'm not mistaken, I think Relly is a, one of the original members, or one of the original, first, sorry, founders of ASAP Mob. He might be one of the people that actually invented the fucking name. And the irony of this is, if you remember your ASAP Rocky law, or ASAP Mob law, you would know that Rocky, I think, was the last addition, one of the late additions into ASAP Mob. He got introduced to ASAP Mob, if I'm not mistaken, through, um, what's his face? Ah, oh, I forgot his fucking name, he passed away. Um, that's who he got introduced to for the ASAP Mob with. And maybe even Bari, but he wasn't an OG member. So imagine falling out with somebody who's the founding member of the group you were in, but you are also the most famous member from that group. Really, really bizarre. Especially, again, when you consider his fucking life options and shit, you shouldn't be doing this. But let's watch the clip. This actually is the clip that they are using to say that there's enough evidence to take it to court because I guess they were trying to throw it out. Right? That's it, Yams, yeah. Yams, I think, is the one that introduced Rocky to ASAP Mob. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure Relly and somebody else started Mob. Maybe it was ASAP 12, I forgot who it was, but there was two people that started the Mob and then those guys got introduced later on down the line um but yeah this is the video that they've been using in the court to basically say hey this is why this case should be going to court or should be going to trial sorry and it's kind of hard to tell what's going on but you can see a couple of figures in the background wrestling for something and i guess the allegation is that there was a gun involved oh no this is not the video this is this is rocky uh what you call it arriving at court he looks good though to be fair He's wearing a really nice suit, double-breasted with a good brooch on. That's him sitting in court with a face mask on. And this is the video playing. So in the video, you have a guy in a hoodie and another guy wrestling, kind of like grappling with each other. And I guess in that grappling of each other, somebody fired a gun. And I guess Relly is alleging that Rocky fired the gun and it hit his hand. But the odd thing about this story is that it, there's a video footage that shows ASAP Relly and his girlfriend going back to the scene and picking up the shell casings. So I don't know. I don't know if they were on scamming or on basically trying to jam up Rocky from the beginning because it seems odd. If you get shot in the hand, or if you get shot in any way, why are you then concerning yourself to go pick up the shell casings? You know, it seems a bit strange. But there's a video here anyway. It shows some people grappling in the video. 
it's hard to make out on a let me, let me rewind a bit. It's hard to make out who the people are in the actual video, to be honest. But there's some grappling happening. They kind of hold on to each other. They push each other. Maybe Rocky's the one in the black hoodie, actually. He's a bit shorter. Maybe that's Rocky there. That's 12 in the with the dreads. So maybe 12 is gonna get um, asked to interview. There's Rally there. And then Rocky pull oh, it looks like Rocky pulls out. Ooh. Yeah, there's Rocky with a gun there, isn't it? Oh no. You don't see him fire it, but you see him with a gun. He kind of postures towards Relly. Right? He kind of postures towards him. If I kind of scrub back on this video, you see Rocky basically doing that universal black boy thing, right? Where he kind of puts his arms out like a fucking kangaroo. Right? He does that side thing with his hands and then he pulls out a gun from his jeans, if I'm not mistaken. A gun comes out for his jeans and he fires it towards him. Man, I don't get this, man. Honestly. Exactly. Bro's married to a millionaire and he's doing this. Like, what? A billionaire? So not a millionaire. A fucking billionaire and he's doing this. Like, what the fuck is he doing? Big up LSAP 12 for trying to stop this, but too little, too late. And I bet you the reason why they were beefing in the first place was super redacted. I bet you it was super dumb. The reason why they were actually having a fight in the first place. The reason why they got into some sort of physical altercation. I bet he was incredibly fucking stupid. Because he did the same guys ASAP more honestly. For as much as I like them with music and whatnot and the fashion and the activations and the shows, they're also full of a bunch of weirdos, isn't it? ASAP Mob is the first group that I saw where the individuals were beefing over fucking Supreme. They were beefing over clothes. Like ASAP Nas, like beefing people. Oh yeah, I wore this first. I remember ASAP Nas got into some beef with Tyler the Creator because he thought that he was, I don't know, that, that style that Nas has where he wears like para boots and these little fucking, you know, uh, train conductor hats. When when Tyler the Creator was doing it, he got into a beef with him because he thought that he invented that style or something. Like, insane, right? Bari gets into fights over fucking clothes. These guys are fucking wild um, and really redacted. So it wouldn't surprise me if this argument in the first place was something incredibly stupid. So yeah, you see Rocky there and you see the gun there. See, you see the gun. There's a gun there. Rocky pulls the gun in his trousers. You clearly see it. So that's definitely Rocky, unfortunately. Um, is he wearing the Puma jeans? No, he's not. He's wearing some other jeans. But he's wearing... He's actually, oh, that's a Mastermind hoodie though. He's got that good Mastermind hoodie, right? Mastermind with the be, with the with the bedazzlements, with the gems all over it. He's got a good Mastermind hoodie on there as he's pulling out the strap and fucking firing on one of his old friends and shit. Absolutely crazy. Let's continue with this little clip here from the courtroom. Oops, let's go back. I don't know what he's doing that for. Yep, he pulls the gun back into his short trousers. He walks off and rarely walks off also. Oh no, he fires it, I guess. Sounds of like the gunshots now. Bang. Only one, two. His lawyer said the video is not him. So he's arguing it's not him, but it clearly does look like him. He's also walking like him again. I don't know Rocky too much, but I can tell how he walks. It looks like him, unfortunately. And with it being LA, he's fucked. Because I was one person, I didn't expect Tory Lanez to go down for the Megan Thee Stallion shooting. Because if you actually analyze the evidence, there wasn't a lot of evidence that pointed to him actually holding the gun and sh firing at fucking Megan. But unfortunately, because the gun was in his quote unquote possession and he was already, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't he a convicted felon already? He had some sort of court case already on his head. I didn't know that LA doesn't play when it comes to the fucking gun laws and shit. That's why he got such a long time in terms of sentencing. So if, if Tory Lane's case is anything to go by, Rocky's going to actually do some jail time. Unless he's actually got a robust and crazy good lawyer I expect him to do some jail time, unfortunately, because it looks like he had the gun. It looks like he fired it. There's obviously the sound of it. Obviously, there's a victim willing to testify and point him out in court. He's going to go to fucking jail, which is such a shame. Like, what are you doing being a bad man? You're married to fucking Rihanna, man. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your collabs. Enjoy getting flown out to fucking fashion week. You know, ugh. Anyway, it says here, rapper ASAP Rocky will stand trial on charges that he fired a pistol in a feud um, with a former childhood friend. The decision came on Monday during a second day of preliminary hearing, which attended by Rocky, real name Rakeem Myers. Prosecutors say Mr. Myers, 35, pointed and fired a gun at Terrell Efron two years ago, causing minor injuries. Yo, how long does it take to fucking court cases to go, for cases to go to trial? This happened two years ago fucking hell man so his life he's been in some level of you know he's been in limbo 
or some sort of like freedom purgatory for two years. This also might explain, am, am I, is this a bit of a stretch? If I say this, may, this might explain why there's all these pictures of Rihanna and Rocky everywhere, like being amazing mums and dads, like being the coolest mums and dads. Is that part of the, do you think that was part of the slide defence? That his team tried to make sure that whenever they whenever Rocky's pictured, he's with Rihanna. Whenever Rihanna's pictured, she's with Rocky. Whenever they're together, the kids are and there. Maybe they wanted to put for this image of a perfect family, of him being a family man, him being a great dad, so that it would help his case. I wonder if that was a thing because this happened. It feels like two. It feels like two years ago is when the content with Rocky and Rihanna was really ramping up. You see every bit of content about them online, online. They, they, look, they look amazing, don't get me wrong. But hmm, even the recent picture that I've seen on social media of them with their kid in the fucking playground somewhere wearing match, matching Luebe tracksuits or matching Luebe, Luebe track jackets. Or so, sorry. It's like, really? His and hers Luebe track jackets? Anyway, it continues. The Grammy-nominated Mr. Myers, who has had two number one albums, is facing two felony counts of assault. That sentence is fucking wild. You're Grammy-nominated with two number one albums, and you're now facing a two felony assault charges with a firearm. Do you know how insane that is? Do you know how dumb that is? Nobody in his position to be, should be doing what he's doing. Fucking hell, man. He could receive up to nine years in prison if found guilty. Mr. Efren, who was part of ASAP Mob's Hip Hop Collective and known him since they were time together at New York High School, alleges separately in a lawsuit that he's a victim of assault and battery and negligence and emotional distress. Imagine what kind of beef you have to be in to fire on somebody that you went to fucking high school with. Like, I guess maybe only your real close friends can actually get under your skin like that. But really and truly, you should be able to walk away from that situation if you were actually real friends from fucking high school. Like, really? That's, this is really disappointing. Mr. Efron, known as ASAP Relly, says Mr. Myers lured him to an obscure location outside the W Hotel in Hollywood on 6th of November to discuss a disagreement. Imagine getting told to come outside to, of, of the fucking W Hotel in, in Hollywood to, to beef. These ASAP guys are crazy, innit? They're like beefing at Complex Con, beefing during Fashion Week, beefing outside of fashion shows in stores, outside of hotels, all these bait places. Like, anyway, CCTV footage of the alleged assault was played in court that shows Mr. Myers brandishing and firing a gun. An LA detective testifies earlier this morning. Of course, it's clearly him. Mr. Myers' lawyers deny that it's the their client who is seen in the video. That's the only defense. It wasn't him. Superior Court Judge M.L. Villa only had to decide whether this case was sufficient enough to go to to bring forward, not whether the crime had been committed. The burden of proof is significantly lower for preliminary hearings like these. Mr. Efron is also suing Mr. Myers, claiming that after a verbal altercation, Mr. Myers pulled a handgun in and personally promised the direction of Mr. Efron and fired multiple times. So he's going to sue him also. So he's going to get he's going to get the bag. And he's going to get Rocky sent to prison. Again, I'll be shocked if he doesn't get no prison time. Considering what happened with fucking Tory Lanes and there not being any fucking gunshot residue on his hands and shit and him still getting the time that he got for the Megan Thee Stallion fucking shooting, it's, um, I am prone to believing he's going to get some time. Mr. Efron was struck by a bullet projectile fragment in his left hand and required medical attention. According to the courts, he's seeking at least $25,000. That's he's aiming a bit low, isn't it? There, isn't it? I would have aimed way higher. I would have made that 25 million <laughs> or 2.5 million, to be fair. Fucking hell. At a court hearing in August 2022, the judge ordered Mr. Myers to stay 100 feet away from Mr. Efron. Mr. Myers was previously given a two year spending sentence for his role in a brawl in Stockholm. He is being represented in Los Angeles by lawyer Joe, Tra Joe Tapokio. Joe Tacopina, sorry, Joe Tacopina, who is also representing former President Donald Trump in a civil case. ASAP Rocky, he's one of the breakout stars, blah, 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 blah. Jesus Christ, man. Absolute horror show of a situation. But one thing is for sure, Rocky's got that good suit on him. He looks fucking incredible in the suit. Uh, he's wearing this really nice double-breasted number. Um, it fits him really well. No really crazy stuff. The hair is braided on point. And I really do like this little brooch detail. I know it's, it's a bit of a serious, you know, allegation that's going on at the moment and it's a serious case, but this brooch detail on the double-breasted jacket is pretty sublime. I'm not going to lie. 
is pretty, pretty sublime. The fucking suit fits amazing, great on the shoulders, is tailored to fuck. It's got that good black fucking face mask on, the good Ray Bands, the braids are tight, and the trousers are all done. You know? I love it. I love it. Nice brooch there on the jacket. He looks really good. He looks really fucking good. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. So big up, Rocky. Bang your doors. If you're going to go to jail, at least put that shit on. And he did it. He's got that fucking shit on. So bang your doors, Rocky. Bang your fucking, fucking doors. That's what I say. Bang your doors. Moving on from that one, we have this story, courtesy of the Shade Borough, regarding entrepreneur and influencer. Oh, they didn't spell it properly. Big up fucking the Shade Borough and their inability to fucking copyright. Uh, entrepreneur and, inf and influencer Ben Anderson accused of defrauding investors $8 million. Now, I don't really know who Ben Anderson is. I just found out about him via Shade Borough, so I'm not going to come you know get on here and pretend i know who this guy is but having done a brief bit of research and heard him speak he's basically a promoter right he's basically a promoter he puts on big events here in the uk and it seems like he was defrauding defrauding his investors and when you read the story it's pretty outlandish and again it goes to show that i think a lot of fraud obviously there are people that don't do fraud well but i think the the majority of people who get caught when they're frauding or scamming, it's because they're being too greedy. That's my honestly, that's my honest prevailing thought. Because I know of a lot of people when I grew up in my area and stuff who are banging ACs, right? Doing credit card scams and shit. And the ones that did it to get like studio equipment, to get their first laptop, to do driving lessons, most of them knew to do it, go in, go out. It was never a long-term thing. It was never, oh, I'm going to bang ACs. I'm going to bang whatever drops until the end of time. They knew it had a time limit. They knew it wasn't a forever thing. But because they didn't have the ability to maybe pay for driving lessons straight away or maybe pay for a new laptop or whatever it may be, or studio equipment and whatnot, microphones, cameras, all that good shit, they would do it with the scam money. And then they would go legit. But you wouldn't do it long term and you wouldn't just keep, you know, fucking scamming the people that you're working with also. You wouldn't do that. You just do it for the time you need it or do it for what you actually need and then ditch it and go legit um, long term. That's what most people did. But I think this guy did a bit too much. So let's read the story. Influencer and entrepreneur Ben Anderson, who featured on Good Morning Britain, faces accusations of defrauding investors, allegedly stealing eight million with his wife Sophie through the business Musical.ese. Now, the funny thing is, if you're wondering, where's the wife Sophie? You know where Sophie is? Nowhere to be found. Because Sophie is a very, very Caucasian lady. And in all the articles that I've seen, it just features this Ben Anderson guy. Now, to be fair, having done my preliminary Googles, it is quite hard to find pictures of his wife Sophie. So maybe she's a private individual. But I find it hilarious that all the news articles are leading with pictures of this Ben Anderson guy, but not including pictures of his wife. It just seems like he did it on his own when really him and his wife were doing the Bonnie Clyde scam thing. But hey, we continue. Despite not promoting any concerts. <laughs> you see how we will scam? How could you have a concert promotion company not promote any concerts? Like, that's doing too much. If you're going to scam, put the concert on. Maybe over, maybe, you know, maybe write down big, higher figures than what the actual figures are overcharge people and then keep the fucking difference but at least put the fucking event on don't just put no event on and then start scamming people that's a bit too much personally it's all like the caesar penny thing with right? the flipping houses with dj envy a lot of that scam was more so the uh, you know not even the fact that the deals went bad it was more so that there was no houses in the first place all those building sites they went to go visit weren't even in his hate name they didn't buy anything on that on those lots. They just took people's money that like they were gonna flip use it to flip houses and just pocketed it. Crazy. So, despite not promoting any concerts, they allegedly created a fabricated invoices and bank statements to create the illusion of effort. As stated the Doc London Circuit Commercial Court. Jonathan Cohen KC, representing the claimants, asserted in court. This is a case of theft by Mr. and Mrs. Anderson of 8 million and Mr. and Mrs. Anderson are fraudsters. So they fooled, they fucking faked, counterfeited, fabricated bank statements and shit. Wow. And invoices. I bet you that's a lot easier than people think, isn't it? I bet if you actually want to get a business loan, you could probably fake an invoice 
or a pay slip and probably be approved for a business loan pretty quickly. I bet you the the fucking due diligence they need to do to kind of approve loans and stuff isn't as stringent as you probably think. It probably happens quite often. They have cheated the claimants out of many millions of pounds by the pretense of seeking funding to promote concerts at which famous musicians will perform. There was no such concerts organised, no attempt to organise them, and no prospects of these concerts ever happening. I love lawyer speak, right? Like, no such court concerts were organised, no attempt was made to make them, and there's no prospects of them being made in the future. So, covered all the fucking bases, you know? I love it. Past, present, future. Mr. and Mrs. Anderson simply spent the money on high living. A close study of their bank statements reveal that almost none of the money was spent on business purposes. It was spent on high living. The couple said that they needed 28000 per month. This is to cover the cost of two nannies and a huge rented house. Yo. When I found out, I think I was checking... I was on YouTube recently. Oh, no. I was on Instagram recently. And I stumbled across this really cool hat. I think it's made by like Sundays, XYZ or XCZ, something like that, right? It's this cool hat that all the little trendy fashion hipster kids in London are wearing, which has got this like little checkerboard design, right? It's like kind of checkerboard design. Uh, I don't know, whatever color it is and black, whatever dark color, you know, all over the fucking hat. And I only realized recently that that hat was made by Magnus, the YouTube kid, right? That's got a brand called Ronin. I didn't know that that was his brand. It's cool. I saw that his brand and I went on his YouTube channel because I haven't seen his YouTube channel in a while. Check out that Magnus Ronings YouTube channel, really good. And he has a he has a video up where he's basically talking about his new apartment and his old apartment. And he mentioned that his old apartment, I think it's a very swanky place. It might be, I'm gonna high pop, I'm gonna guess it's probably somewhere in South, no, it's probably somewhere in East London or North London, next to the canal or something, right? But it's a really nice apartment. Um, but one bedroom, kind of a small, you know, bachelor little pad. And he said he basically paid £2,850 per month, nearly 3 k per month. And my jaw hit the floor. Obviously, reading the comments, I found out that in that area that he's in, or for that kind of layout of a building or layout of a flat, it's quite standard. But can you imagine paying three grand a month for rent? I could never imagine that. To rent somewhere, not somewhere you're paying with your mortgage or whatever, you're renting somewhere for three grand per month is insane. I don't see how any family could need 28,000 to survive. Like, what are you actually buying? What are you, why, where is the money actually going that will justify wanting a 28,000 um, budget for your living cost per month? Like, honestly, do you have a nanny per kid? Like, a nanny per hour or something? Like, what the hell is going on? And again, this is for, I mean, pure evidence of just doing too much. They probably could have scammed, but they just did too much and then they got caught because they got greedy. It was spent on first class flights to holidays, places like Dubai. Cohen's rants did not stop and there was uh, he would go on to call the people common or garden grifters. Sorry, common or garden grifters. Their defense, as presented by the court, states the Andersons initially planned to organize the concerts and were not fraudsters from the start, but the situation got out of control. So they're trying to make it seem like one of those startup things, right? They they had good intentions, but then they failed because of X, Y, and Z. It's like, shut the fuck up, bro. Um, Seward Atkins, legal representative of defendants, informed the court that Mr. Mr. Anderson claimed to be one of figures in the music industry. They consensus accusations that they were in incapable of organizing concerts for an artist. <laughs> oh, the court's killing them. Um, the couple expressed their commitment to repay all the debts included uh, incurred for their clients and uh, however unforeseen circumstances such as pandemic lockdowns and tragic death of twin babies led to a collapse of their business mr watkins explained to judge um richard's peace the concerts might have happened if it was for the pandemic and extraordinary personal tragedy the death of their twin babies oh wow so their kids died in the midst of them running this scam. Pretty crazy, isn't it? Pretty, 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 pretty crazy. But yeah, 28 grand per month um, living cost is fucking insane. 
defrauding people eight grand is insane and also just this whole like social media influencer type of guys anyway you have to keep your eye out for them they're always full of shit in my personal opinion i think those guys are always always full of shit the ones that's like oh a day in the life of a billionaire here's what i do rise and grind i finish all my chores all my stuff i need to do before 7 a.m then the day is free to do whatever i want to do minimalist da -da -da, american psycho here i come it's like come on bro again like please so yeah be careful out there keep your head in the swivel but if you see a black guy that looks like this, most likely he's definitely scamming. In my humble opinion, most definitely, he's definitely, definitely scamming. So I'm sure most of you guys have seen this also. James Whitner, the founder and the leader over there of the Whitner Group that also is the umbrella company for social status and Amen, Aman Mania, that fucking crazy brand, unfortunately has been rumbled in a fucking multi-million dollar sneaker money laundering scheme pretty fucking wild especially when you consider you know his persona how he comes across the quote-unquote free game he's always dropping and whatnot his interviews his collaborations this is a pretty pretty big quote-unquote whale that's out here basically stealing his valor you know what i mean so let's continue here it says james whitner has long been revered as a name in the sneaker industry whitner is a visionary behind the owner of the whitner group an umbrella company that owns um lauded stores like amamania and social status apb and prosper among the sneaker community whitner has been known as more than just a business owner he's a trendsetter storyteller and a champion of the consumer basically i'm gonna be honest i fucking hate the storyteller thing i really do I despise people calling jeans or trousers or whatever it may be called, you know, these couple of names. Just like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just fed up of trying to tell stories through colorways of, of shoes. Trying to tell a story, especially a story about race, segregation, oppression, subjugation, right? Whatever, through the colorway of sneakers is so naff. Can we just get back to people making good colorways? Right, people putting on the, the their, their fucking design app, people pulling out the Pantone book and actually going crazy, as opposed to trying to, you know, turn shoes into a fucking activism point. It's just like, come on, allow it. Let's continue. Um, the news was first reported by WSOC TV, um, Friday, November seventeenth. A civil forfeit case, a well, forfeit case, sorry, was brought by United States Attorney Dana King and verified ASS, um, IRS, sorry, Special Agent Agent Ranjed. Um, West complaints, complaints want to. So what's that? Yeah, what does it say here? So the complaint wants to seek approximately 1.1 1 .1 billion um, of US currency seized from Antoine Freeman's apartment. Freeman has been cited as a mentor of for Whitner and the two relationship dates back to mid 2000s when the first social state campus um, social status location opened in Pittsburgh. The complaint um, cites that Whitner's involvement in the Alessis money transferring business, MTB, interweaved with the various legal activities. YG and a national Chinese, uh, a national Chinese referred to in court uh, documents as a central figure in this scheme allegedly distributed and sold sneakers and apparel in Asia and has been conducting business with Witness since 2016. In the documents, there is alleged to be more than 255 occasions in which Whitner, his businesses and others involved, received cash from YG, which transaction each transaction totaled more than 10,000. Each under the US law require more uh, filing and a license to do so. Just sounds like some Wings of Redemption shit, isn't it? Like, doing everything in your power to get the most out of everything without doing anything. However, none of the business individuals or entities involved in the money developed proper, properly uh, and obviously obtained uh, insecure the register of MTB. Um, PNC Bank has handing a large amount of the decrease of money. Blah, blah, blah. What's happening here? Web Whitner is also accused of violating contracts with a state, uh, with a violating contracts Vite contract with sneaker companies, one of which is referred in the court documents as an Oregon-based manufacturer, which is probably Nike, by reselling exclusive. Yeah, so this is the thing, right? So this is the main thing that he did wrong here. One of which is referred to the court documents as an Oregon-based manufacturer by reselling exclusive sneakers to unauthorized parties. So essentially backdooring. So this is confirmation, if ever we needed it, 
that backdooring is a prevalent and frequent occurrence in the sneaker industry or in retail or whatever it may be. They do it all the time. We've known this, especially if you're a kid who grew up queuing outside the stores. If you if you grew up just going to stores and just trying to buy as much limited edition stuff as possible. If you care about tears or stuff, whatever it is, and you're part of the culture and the scene, you would know that backdooring has been a thing for a long time. This is not a new thing. People have been backdooring forever. But the annoying thing about backdooring nowadays, I feel like... I feel like stores now are taking a the piss. They're not prioritizing the customers whatsoever. If anything, they are getting in their limited edition run of shoes and they're backdooring a bunch, but they're backdooring way more than they're actually selling on release date. So even if they do get a thousand shoes in, most likely you know you're not going to get number one or number 1,000, but you would imagine you might get a high 20s or 30s. And it's like, nah, if you don't buy an initial drop, those first 20 or 50 are already allocated to whatever influence it may be going forward. So that's the only really sad situation about the whole thing. I mean, it continues. This includes a Chinese retailer outside of the US, right? So they will get limited edition shoes from Nike and then they'll resell them, backdoor them to retailers in China for double, triple the markup. I noticed that recently. If you go on places like Taobao and stuff, you'll find legit authentic shoes that are being resold on there for way more than you'll find on StockX and shit. So there's a business of that that exists over there as well. People reselling limitation shoes and whatever. Because it kind of reminds me also at the time when I was in the sneaker space, I used to buy Air Max 1s or Air Max 90s and shit from JD Sports and resell them to guys in Australia. I wasn't really reselling. I was mostly acting as mo I was mostly acting as a proxy. So they'd give me a small fee on top, maybe 20 pounds, whatever. And then I'd go and buy these shoes from fucking Adidas. Sorry, from um, JD Sports, like infrared 90s, like Royal Blue Air Max 1s and the red ones also, right? All these little classic colorways that I guess they weren't able to get over there in Australia and shit and New Zealand and send them over. It was pretty funny that day, that era, man. Which helped me a lot because when I was in uni, when I would say Martin's like, I didn't have a job. I didn't work a job at all. I couldn't get a job, not because I was too good for it, but I couldn't find a job because I had literally no experience. So the only way I actually had money and fed myself and made sure I was all drippy and shit and I was able to go on holiday was reselling shoes. So I've never been against reselling, but I just think unfortunately now it's the most it's the most dominating part of sneaker culture. People talk about prices of shoes all the time. It seems like there's there's always another new fucking pimpled, you know, face kid on Instagram flexing in front of boxes of shoes that they're never going to wear. It's, it's just it become too much of an issue for me personally. That's the main thing. It's become the main thing and not just part of it. Um, it continues. Um, this includes a Chinese retailer outside of the United States, which Whitner and his business um, use code names such as Nevada and Kansas to refer to. The operation facilitated the movement of large amounts of cash, some of which was derived from illegal activities such as narcotics, operation and prostitution. That's the big deal, isn't it? If you're one of these people who believes in activism, who's a social justice warrior, especially when it comes to clothes and sneakers, you're going to be in a little bit of a predicament because essentially they're saying, I'm an in, I'm, I'm an ear and fucking social status were propped up by fucking narcotic operations and prostitution which may include sex trafficking that's where that's where their money was coming from that is a quintessential definition of blood money so you know how much do you like you know rocky's outfits and his looks and stuff to excuse such a fucking behavior it's pretty pretty crazy it continues here the money subsequently was introduced into the banking system without proper reporting and regulations a clear violation of the secretary act of course that was him to skirt the taxes right so he was reselling them to chinese people getting the money converted to fucking chinese money and then sending it back to himself so so he wouldn't pay any taxes um it continues here freeman and others involved in this scheme allowed them to profit from the transactions that violated conduct agreement with the Oregon-based sneaker company. It's obviously Nike. Why do they keep saying that? Do you know what I mean? Do they think they're going to get sued if they say Nike? Anyway, how did the money laundering scheme come to a stop? I'm eager to hear this, actually. What do they say about this? Um, YG would purchase sneakers, apparel from Whitner, and then an individual referred to as broker who was based in, in China would receive payment from YG for the items YG's been buying. During, uh, sorry, what, what, what uh, sorry, buying from Whitner. Money couriers would collect US dollars and once accumulating a certain amount of money would deliver the funds to Antoine Freeman. Freeman, who was also not registered or a license or registered whatever on MTB, began to facilitate handling the cash donor donations from 2019. 
After 2019, Winter, Winter seized his speed, he cash deposits in the Charlotte. The money was also going through the foundation, a brown development corporation operated by Freeman out of Manhattan. Despite Whitner and associate telling MP PNC Bank, uh, the um, Whitner allegedly would advise Freeman on when the money was coming in from Asian individuals on the New York area, and after receiving the money, would rather would direct Freeman on where to store the money. Whitner also notified that when the cash was mentioned, he'd had sixty five of cash received, what person delivered, or what the the. So anyway, that's what he said about that, right? And then if you scroll. On the complex article, you actually see some more information. Cursive complex, right? They've actually got a picture of what they found when they walked up to this guy's house, right? So let's read the complex article here. The complex article says as following. Um, ba, 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 ba. Let's see here. The complex article says, the compliance is that Freeman and Whitner out colluded with the Chinese money laundering operation to benefit of Whitner's business. These transactions involved Freeman, Whitner and others comprised of Islanders money transmitting businesses, according to prosecutors. In the response to the complaint, Whitter, Whitaker Group highlighted its work to support people of colour and tell stories that would um, work under uh, under attack despite productive engagement with the US Attorney's Office. We look forward to defending ourselves on our business. The picture described of Chinese National Anthem Theater is that, blah, blah, blah. As you can see, you can see more pictures of there, of the store on the inside and whatnot. Nice fucking display units there, actually. And then let's go back to the article itself. Uh, not that one. Where are you? Where are you? There you go here. Um, how the money laundering scheme operated YG would purchase sneakers like I said before we already mentioned that uh, Winter was notified when the cash was delivered the amount of cash received was the person delivered the cash and the person received the cash Winter maintained a spreadsheet of these cash deliveries and related operations right so this man is all about his fucking money right he's all about his money he always stands on business there's no fucking around with him right no fucking around with him let's see if we can find it okay nothing going on here how about if we go back to fucking, um, what you call it, that brilliant podcast. Let's see what that happens here, what they said around this one. And we continue. Uh, okay, cool. Not, nothing said there. Oh, no, this is not the one, is it? It's here. Where am I going? There we go. Whoops. Wrong article again. Da! Anyway, going back. So, yeah, going back to the complex article. Look at the, look at the fucking stack of money they found at his house. Mama Mia, the civil forfeit complaint contains photos of money seized from Antoine Freeman. This is just in his crib. I, don't, I think that's like a million, isn't it, right? Jesus Christ us. If ever you, if, if ever you wanted a, an evidence of like you did the crime, then finding all of these fucking crisp banknotes in your crib is probably evidence that you did what you've been accused of, right? Um, the civil complaint says that Whitner would initially visit Freeman in New York City and transfer the money back to Charlotte, where Socialist is based. But in 2019, the complaint urges he began employing Brink to transport the money. Whitner instructed those involved um, on how to transfer the money so that he would avoid being flagged by financial institutions. Prosecutors say that between November 2017 and April 2022, Witness's business... Witnesses' businesses did more than $32 million worth of transactions with YG. Oh my God. The money was spread out across 255 transactions with each exceeding $10,000. The complaint says that Whitner did not file the documents legally required for these transactions. $32 million. You see what I said about people being greedy? You see what I said about this a story here? There we go. The Ben Anderson story, right? This guy, 28000 per month he needed. Defrauding his investors of a total of $8 million. It's just too much. If you're going to do fraud again, you should probably live a life where you're telling the truth and doing the right thing. But if you're going to do fraud to kind of get yourself, you know, up and needed equipment and whatnot and help yourself out, pay the bills, do it once, maybe twice. That's it. Then go legit. Find a real job. Whether it's fucking flipping burgers or working in a bar, find an actual legit source of income. Don't go out there and do scams forever because you're eventually going to get caught. Because this guy thought he was clever, right? He thought he could do 255 different transactions all over 10,000 to get to that number of 32 million to kind of, you know, dance around things and get away with shit. But they're always watching. They're always fucking watching. And eventually they tied it all together anyway. 
Law enforcement arrested Freeman in August 2021 as he was walking into his office in Midtown Manhattan. He was carrying a backpack and deposit bag. According to the court documents, a search of his apartment turned up um, 1.2 million in cash hidden in closets in UPS boxes. USPS boxes. Jesus Christ. During the subsequent investigation, the complaint says that law enforcement monitored the movements of another 1.5 million in Ireland's money transmitting business activities. Freeman pled guilty to mispris um, to misprison of felony, faced role in the money transfer. Two of the money couriers brothers, Long was it Long Zi Zhuang and Long Juan Zhuang, were also hit with criminal charges. Yo, Chinese man, them have got money for sneakers, isn't it? Chinese men then probably spend way more Asian, well, specifically Chinese people, they might actually spend more money on designer goods, limited edition items than black people. I know black people get a bad rep for being flashy and wearing designer items, but I think Chinese people, they fundamentally care about designer stuff, limited edition stuff to a level that even a black person wouldn't, to be fair. The money they spend on stuff, because imagine they were buying stuff from social status, from Aman Mania, from that guy, from that Whitner guy, right? For resale prices. And they were reselling off. That's the thing you have to keep in mind. They buy resale shoes for an exorbitant amount of money, and then they sell them for more money than they purchased them for. So they end up getting their money back, even though they're selling them for crazy amounts. Because there's always somebody out there that wants that limited edition shoe. Doesn't want the hassle of queuing up. That's one thing Chinese people don't fuck about with. Chinese people do not like inconvenience. They want to go somewhere, buy the thing and go home. They're not into the queue shit. They don't want to wait around. They've got the money. They'll pay for it. Give me the thing. It's all like Middle Eastern people, right? Give me a new one. Give me this one. Give me that one. You know what I mean? Give me four. Give me all of them. Like, they just want their shit straight away. No fucking around. When prosecutors say, um, while well, prosecutors say the millions of dollars in transactions were at the behest of his companies, Whitner was not been charged. Deals of the civil forfeit complaint suggest that he knew something was awry in his reselling business. So this is really odd. He hasn't been charged yet. What's going on? Is he snitching? Most likely he's, he's cooperating, right? If he hasn't been charged, if he's the fucking main guy at the Whitner group and all of these other fucking businesses are under that umbrella, which this guy is then you backdooring the shoes out of to sell to China and then doing a bit of money laundering, which is then funding criminal enterprises like fucking prostitution and maybe sex trafficking. Why wouldn't Whitner be charged? Most likely he's probably involved in it. Most likely he's probably cooperating. You'd imagine that's why he hasn't been formally charged. The complaint, um, the complaint, sorry, describes a consensually monitored phone call. A consensually, how does that even mean? Um, between Freeman and Whitner that took place in July 2022. Prosecutors say that in this conversation, the two discussed Freeman's arrest and the seizure of 50,000 men for the transaction with YG. On that call, Witness said that he had a feeling something fishy was going on. Wow. Let's go back to the main article here. I think it's got the actual details. It breaks it down. We see that's him, right? To be fair, he's got, he's got a very... You know what he kind of reminds me of? He reminds me a little bit of um, Idris Elba in, in The Wire, right? He's got that look of that guy that's like, he's about that life. He used to do some street shit, but now he's trying to go legit. But he's still got that street shit in him. He can't let it go because he's got a very successful business, stores, collaborations coming out of the wazoo, right? But he still is involving himself in illicit businesses. Why? You don't need to do it, brother, man. Come on. And this is a statement that they put out, right? The statement. Um, with a Whitaker Group official statement regarding the money laundering, right? The recent action by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Western District of North Carolina comes with significant cooperation and good faith negotiations, aka snitching, on our part. To be clear, while we take the allegations of the complaint seriously, they are unfounded, unrelated to our business or to this community and unjustified. Our professional inventory, our professional inventory management team runs a ah. Oh, you threw the you threw the inventory management team under the bus, man. Our professional inventory management team runs a transparent process built on systems that are both legally compliant and consistent with industry standards. We have also compiled uh, complied sorry with tax obligations annually. 
So basically, I pay my taxes and it wasn't me, it was my interns. <laughs> People love blaming the interns, and the interns don't even get paid. They don't get paid well. They get treated like fucking shit. They get worked around the clock. And then when stuff goes wrong, the boss always points to them like it's their fault. The fucking interns. We disagree with the USAO's allegations concerning our business and remain um, appreciative of the extraordinary support our vendor partners have shown and continue to show throughout this process. Our success has made us an easy target caught in the middle of a US financial and regulatory war with China of which we have no part in. Oh, it's the man. The man is trying to hold the black man down. BLM. March for George Floyd. These sneakers are going to end racism. Anti-racism shoes. What? What? Social status, social hierarchy. Oh, come on, man. We look forward to def uh, defending our business and operating model while we continue to proudly serve our biz com communities that have embraced us for the last 20 years. We scammed. We might be in trouble, but we're still going to run these numbers up. Jordan 5's dropping very soon, right? These Jordan 5's. I've been there pretty shit, to be fair. Everybody's getting hype over them, but I don't really see the hype. Obviously, the, the, the newer updated shape is quite nice. It's more of a mid. There's less padding on the tongue as well. They sit a bit nicer. Don't get me wrong, right? The Jordan 5 has been updated shape-wise. But I think these Dusk and Dawn fucking Am I Many shoes are pretty shit, personally. I like the little bubble um, text on it with their logo in it or sorry with their brand name but i'm not i don't really give a fuck about these shoes everyone's going wild for them online but again I, my my algorithm is a bit fucked because sneaker twitter only, only really exists for fucking americans americans love jordans there's no jordan that they won't love no matter how boring the shape is no matter how fucking tired the colorways are they'll always wank over jordans but i think they're a little bit boring personally but yeah they're coming very soon let's go back to the fucking statement um this complaint will not deter us from continuing to tell our stories and to build a legacy of excellence and while, and we will continue to vigorously defend our businesses and all that they contribute to culture, commerce and community. So I did not do it. I did not do it. So fast facts before we kind of seal this up and move on. James Whitner, notable businessman and owner of the Whitner Group, has been named in a civil complaint um, to forfeit for forfeiture regarding money laundering. The complex operation reportedly involved Chinese money couriers and a series of sophisticated financial transactions that flouted vital financial laws designed to prevent money laundering. According to the complaint, Whitner broke at least one business contract with a sneaker company based in Oregon, Nike, that explicitly forbids selling, shipping, or transferring goods sneakers to other countries. Now, just to point on that, you know who else is guilty of it? Yes, you guessed it, Marcus fucking Jordan, the son of Michael Jordan. He is guilty of fucking backdooring. He loves a good backdoor. There's evidence of him doing it. There's literal pictures of Marcus Jordan and his affiliates and his associates at fucking hotels loading up boxes of shoes into fucking unspecified white vans that don't look like they belong to Nike. Literally putting shoes into fucking vans. So if, they, if they're going to cash his Whitner guy, why isn't fucking Marcus Jordan on the chopping block also? Huh? Come on, bro. Um, the business conducted by Whitner, Freeman and others involved in this scheme allowed them to profit from the transactions that violate US federal law. Between November 2017 and April 2022, there was alleged to be more than 255 occasions in which Whitney and his businesses and others involved received cash from the Chinese national named YG. These transactions totaled to 32 million. And when they went to that guy's house, they bust down his door, right? Look what they found. A table full of money like they fucking Floyd Mayweather. Look at that. Jesus Christos. Um, the Whitney group... Sorry, the, Whit the, the Whitaker Group, Whitner Group, the Whitaker Group issued a statement stating that it was cooperating with authorities, snitching, 
um, in their investigation and the claims are unfounded. At the time of writing, James Whitner and the Whitaker Group have not been charged with any crime in connection with this federal complaint, but still they're involved. So let's see how this one plays out. It's very unfortunate. Like I said, this guy is super successful, got a thriving business, got collaborations coming out of his ass. Nike don't stop working with him. His stores are popping. Why do you need to do this? I don't know. For me, it feels like greed. Um, it's really silly, really, really dumb. And thinking you could get away with it is dumb. Maybe doing this for your first meal to pay for a fucking new house or renovations, cool. But really racking up an amount up to fucking 32 million is just too much. You did too much. You got too greedy. You scammed. And eventually that shit bit you in the ass. So it's looking very, very peaky for them guys. It's looking very, very, very peaky for those guys. What can you do? What can you bloody, bloody do? Next on the list here, we've got news courtesy of Primavera Sound, the best festival in Europe, the only festival in Europe that matters, the best festival in Europe, the only festival that matters. Primavera Sound have put out their lineup for next year already. Festival season's already fucking, it's already up, man. Festival season's already around the corner. It's so annoying, bro. I've already got a list, actually. I've got a list of festivals, actually, on my phone. Let me see. Because the ones I want to go to in Europe that I've kind of I've already specced out of things I want to do because I was already upset that I couldn't do anything this year because I was fucking lazy. But next year, the festivals I've got listed. Dre Molen in Netherlands. Nation of Godwana in Germany. Butik in Slovenia. And Horst in Belgium. That's my kind of overall plan five festivals no four sorry including primavera so primavera barcelona dre molin netherlands national godwana germany butik in slovenia and horst in B belgium those are my five festivals and why i'm doing those because obviously london or the uk sorry we have great festivals also um we have great festival culture here right um we're basically a country built on festivals for the best part but the really unfortunate part of it is number one the price of festivals in the uk is exorbitant especially in relation to the experience you're going to have not that great but the worst thing for me apart from the price because you can get used to that is the sound man sorry the sound is so bad the sound is so terrible at uk festivals it really isn't worth going i honestly don't think so and i'm not talking about like an audio file oh the sound is horrible i can't hear the bass no legitimately because we have these really crazy rules around um noise pollution in most parts of the uk you really can't have like massive stacks of speakers or whatever it may be to really get the sound where it needs to go so that wherever you're standing on the field because it's all open air and it's not over a tent or underground you know under a roof it's hard to kind of make things sound great but obviously festivals in europe can do that because they can put speakers up everywhere because they don't have such strict laws around noise pollution from the local council and shit but we do in the uk so a lot of festivals can't really go crazy with the fucking um, sound systems because they're going to get complaints if they get complaints they get shut down immediately usually for the most part even if, even if the festival is in the middle of a field not next to any residential buildings most councils will always side with the residents it's a, it's, a st it's a standard conversation around fucking gentrification and whatever it may be but they always side the residents so if you do skirt the rules if you do try and push the limit you'll get your whole festival cancelled and then you're fucked forever going forward. So you have to comply with the rules and have basically a couple of speakers at the front, nothing at the back, so that if you go to festivals in the UK, you'll notice in pictures and videos, you'll see a horde of people rammed at the front. Now, a lot of them are super fans, but most of the time they're doing that because they spent already 300 quid on a festival ticket. They want to fucking hear what, they, what they're there to hear. Because if you stand too far back, if you're next to the bar, if you're where the toilets are doing a fucking bump, if you're back at, if you know, if you're just standing at the back finger banging someone next to a tree, or if you're just standing at the back at the old man spot where I'm usually at, you can't hear shit or the sound is terrible. So I would much rather spend the extra money to travel somewhere else and go to a festival in Europe and actually hear the people I'm going to go and see. The good thing about the festivals in Europe, they're way more cost effective. I could literally go, I swear to God, I could literally go to Primavera Sound with the flight and the ticket for the same price as it is for the ticket only to somewhere like Glastonbury. I'm pretty sure a flight and an entry ticket to Primavera Sound in Barcelona is going to cost me probably... 200 pounds right 
when is it? It's like in May, right? June, May, two hundred pounds, and the ticket, you know, and the ticket will probably be about the same, two fifty, five hundred euros altogether. A ticket to fucking Glastonbury is already going to be three hundred minimum, and of course, that is if you get in all this sort of malarkey. So the prices are crazy. So you could get flights. So and then this is going to one of the nicest countries in Europe. Great food, great drinking culture, great clubs, great bars, um, sightseeing, all the best bands. So I really do love Primavera. I don't have any other good, you know, I can't say anything more about it. I don't already say about it. I'm really fucking licking their asses. But the lineup is already out here. There's an A to Z listing of the lineup. Um, you got 07. Let me just go for the people that I like. I'm spotted here. Um, 07 Shake, of course. AG Cook. Um, who else I like here? Um, Amare. This girl is fucking amazing. I thought she's actually from. I thought she was from back home, where she is African, but she's, if I'm not mistaken, she's born and bred in New York or something. So, but she's fucking incredible. I really like her. Um, Amari, Amare, I don't know how you pronounce her name, but she's awesome. Um, bad, bad, not good, of course. Arka, great. Um, Beth Gibbons, great. Bikini, great. Charlie XCX, I would love to see their play. Um, what else have you got here? Um, Chloe Callet is a good DJ. I would love to see play. You've got the clips performing. That would be fucking awesome to see them perform together. Um, who else you got here? Um, Disclosure, I would like to see play well. DJ Fire in the Club, I'd like to see perform. Um, Ethel Kane, I would like to see perform. FK Twigs, I would love to see. Freddie Gibbs. Um, Heron Sauna, Sam. To be fair, the DJ gigs are a bit weird. Heron Sauna, Sam, back to back with MCM, back to back with Salomon, back to back with SPF DJ. I'm not really too sure if I want to see a DJ at Primavera Sound. I've got to be honest. I prefer to see like actual live acts or bands or artists. You know what I mean? I think it's a bit, it's a bit naff going to a festival like that with such great, you know, diversity of fucking artists to go into a DJ. A bit of a waste of time, personally. Um, but these are all people confirmed early. High Tech, uh, Julia Moore. Uh, Justice, right? First live performance from them in 2024. That'll be sick to see Justice perform. Lana Del Rey will be fucking sick to go and watch perform. Um, Code Nine again, DJ. I'll probably leave that to the side. Mount Kimball, I wouldn't mind to see. Who else have you got here? Peggy Goo performing. Actually, I wouldn't mind. You know, as a, as a visual, as a visual, I wouldn't actually mind to see Peggy Goo perform because even though I've talked a lot of fucking smack about her over the years. I haven't actually seen her perform with my own eyes and ears. I actually haven't been in a club where she's been performing. I don't think so. Or in the only place. So I wouldn't actually mind to go see her performing. Because she's actually, even though she's a DJ, she does kind of like perform a lot behind the booth. She does take it quite seriously. She has put in a bit of a show. So that might actually be quite fun to go and see. So I wouldn't mind seeing Peggy Group perform actually. I might add it to my list. Um, Omar Apollo, I am definitely want to go see him perform. That'd be pretty good. PJ Harvey, of course. She's always performing at thingy at Primavera, I feel like. Rock Marciano, that'd be sick to see him uh, perform there. One of my favorite rappers, Royzen Murphy. Oh, Royzen Murphy performing at Primavera Sound. <sighs> With a fucking cerveza in your hand and shit. All right? Woo! Twirling around. That's going to be good. Um, who else I like here? Uh, Sega Bodega will be good to see perform as well. Um, who else I like here? Scissor, of course. Yes, we've got to get Scissor there. Scissor will be great to see perform. I'd love to see her perform there. The National, why not? Vampire Weekend, come on, bro. That's going to be a fucking vibe. They've got fucking hits for days. Wolf Eyes, The National, I said already before. Um, Troy Sivan, I feel the rush. Addicted to your touch. Hey, that would be fucking sick hearing that perform live. And a few other people too. Of course, the Blessed Madonna's there as well. And a few other people too. But yeah, Primavera Sound Festival, one for the heads. And Jay Paul as well performing. Jay Paul, I'm not really sure I want to... I, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking forward to seeing it, but I want, to, I want to hear what he sounds like. But he sounds pretty awful when he performs. The last time he performed that was at what, Coachella, I think, innit? And it was fucking garbage. First performance in a while, but it wasn't very good. He can't really sing that well, to be fair, live. So eager to see what that's going to be like. But yeah, um, really good lineup. Love the diversity. Love the breadth. And again, one of my favorite festivals. So I can't wait to go when that does eventually happen. I cannot wait to go. Primavera Sound in Barcelona. You know the vibes. Dates are there, right? 2nd of June to the 29th of May. Was it? Oh, no. Is it two dates here? What's the actual dates, actually? Let me see the dates here quickly before we move on. Uh, let's see. Tickets. And I think the tickets are there. I think they're like 250 if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so it's from the, the 30th of May to the, the 30th of May to the 1st of June. 
Look at the ticket prices, man. 265. That's minor, bro. Considering the other festivals, what they do. You have all those days of great festivals, of great acts, sorry, great sun, nice food and drink and shit. It's a really good price, especially now as well, because you can probably book your tickets to flights super early and get them quite cheap as well. So yeah, big up Primavera. Can't wait to go there when that eventually happens. Next on the list here, we've got this little bit of news to talk about. This is courtesy of the nightclub in Berlin called Anomeli. Well, it's not really a nightclub. It's more so like a performance-y, all-encompassing space thing. But they put up this post on their Instagram, which is quite interesting, right? This is a point a while ago. It says, we, have to, we want to give our guests the rare opportunity to be a part of a global Netflix production and contribute their views and opinions on the nightlife scene of Berlin which we cherish so deeply for this occasion we are throwing a free party to show the world what the values our clubs hold so allegedly netflix are making some sort of documentary feature film series whatever um centering about the nightlife in berlin which is pretty sick and um, obviously if you're a berliner you're going to be upset because this is definitely going to open up berlin and nightlife over there to the masses it's already opened up anyway i think everybody and their mum knows about berlin and the clubs over there but this is definitely going to open it up to way more normies now me being ever the optimist i think this is a good thing i think having new fresh people in the scene with fresh new ideas new perspectives you know different experiences different backgrounds is a net positive for the scene and what I think that it will do is that it will challenge clubs, challenge punters, challenge artists, DJs, whatever, to maybe come forward with a bit more fresher things, newer ways to entertain and to keep people, you know, on the dance floor to make them want to buy tickets continually. Because I feel like at the moment, we're in a little bit of a malaise. Every event's kind of the same. Even when it comes to lighting and productions and shit, everyone's kind of doing the same thing with the light DJs and the VJs and whatever it may be and some of the LED panels and some of the augmented reality things. It's all kind of being a bit formulaic at the moment. So maybe having different people come in who have different expectations, who maybe come from different, you know, who maybe have experienced different shows and feel like they should have a different level of standard for shows of a DJ or from a live act or from a club, that might actually spur people to actually step up, pull their finger out of their asses and come with something actually fresh and new to keep everybody entertained and then it'll be a certain positive for everybody else. Now, the negative of it could be you bring all these normies in who actually have no appreciation for the stuff that's been built before them, the, le the foundation that's been laid, the traditions that take place in these places, the way of going about and behaving and whatnot, and they're going to come in and piss all over it and just trample over it and turn every club in berlin into matrix bar or into matrix right into the matrix club that fucking awful one that's obviously a possibility but i don't think that's the case and if anything as well what it will do maybe it will also just shine a light on people who are doing some great work also i think that needs to be highlighted because i don't think we have since resident advisor has kind of fallen off there aren't really a lot of outlets maybe aside from mine that really speak passionately and openly about nightlife and dance music. And I don't even go that deep into it. I'm not really reviewing EPs. I'm not reviewing loads of shows and stuff. I'm just talking from my own personal experience of being a punter and being a DJ. But I think it's actually a good thing that some of these places and the clubs and the infrastructure around Berlin and places gets put on this sort of platform because you never know. It could have an effect on other places around the world. Maybe parts, places like London, Maybe our councils, maybe our governments might see these programs, the reception, the feedback, the pushback, the complaints from people online, and it might make them think, you know what, maybe we should take the nightlife sector a bit seriously. Maybe we should advocate for these guys more. Maybe we should try to put things in place to make sure that clubs aren't closing at breakneck speed. Maybe we should foster all of these new talents. Maybe we should build sort of some sort of infrastructure that could allow places to flourish and whatnot. So new generations could come in just to line their pockets because that's something I've always been really perturbed about in London. Our nightlife industry is in the billions, right? If you include nightlife, that's broadly across the board that covers things like from theater to fucking restaurants and shit, right? Our nightlife industry makes a lot of money. But for some reason, the country doesn't really take it too seriously. And they don't really, you know, invest much money into it, into its safekeeping or into its safeguarding. So maybe highlighting places like Berlin 
and how unique and sort of like out there it is with this relationship with nightlife and how you know privileged they are to have the scene that they have where they can party from fucking Thursday to Tuesday that might actually give our government a bit of a wake-up call and make them realize that they're leaving money on the table that's the main thing they need to kind of fucking worry about they could be lining their pockets far more than they are now if they would just if they would just invest a bit more money into nightlife which they obviously don't do i would love to see that going forward i really fucking would so i'm really eager to see this documentary i'll see what they're going to do whether it's a documentary or it's a feature film i don't really know but that's what i saw on the timeline so let's hope and pray that it's something good let's hope and pray that it's something good moving on from that one i've got this article here courtesy of in a magazine called filter mag regarding ghb and nightclubs now i've spoken about this ad nauseum on this podcast before but i wanted to read this article mostly because i'm getting to the point now where i'm getting a bit fed up with people complaining about ghb and nightclubs i really am i think some people complain about ghb and the way it makes people act on the dance floor and blah 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 it's sort of like a weird way to sort of like virtue signal about your um you know your be about how well behaved you are in a nightclub about how you are able to keep yourself together about how you don't get lost in the source about how you are a the the cons the consummate raver or it's also from a point of like class a drug snobbery which i never understood it happens a lot in nightlife and i think maybe i even bought into it a little bit when i was talking about crystal meth shit when i was kind of looking down my nose on that there's this weird attitude with people in dance music or in club culture where they have a little bit of an ego. They have a little bit of a, of a superiority complex when it comes to the stuff that they take other people take. Because they don't do GHB, but they do MD, they do Molly, they do Care, they do Speed, they do Coke. They suddenly feel like they are better than people who do stuff like GHB. And it's like, actually, the reality of it is we're all as bad as each other we're all little by little rotting our brains damaging our inside right shortening our lifespan every time we decide to go out get drunk and do drugs we're all doing that in one way shape or form whether it's through cigarettes whether it's through alcohol whether it's through kratom whether it's through fucking happy hippo whether it's through fucking class a we're all damaging our insides and our fucking brains right and we're all kind of limiting the amount of time we actually spend on this spinning ball you know hurtling through space right with our family and shit by ingesting the things that we're ingesting but we do it because we know we're here for a short time not you know we're here for a good time not, not a long time so we do it anyway we take the risk if that's the case maybe we should advocate for more people using stuff like ghb responsibly right if you're going to do a drug if you're going to do if you're going to go out for a drink and i, I think i've mentioned this before but because i've always been that person that tries their darndest to be um a, a good a good partaker in fun right i try and drink responsibly i try and use the gear responsibly i try and be a good proponent so i'm not basically infringe infringing on other people's fun i'm not taking away from their time out i'm not fucking being overbearing i'm not sucking the oxygen out of the room right being responsible in that respect so no one needs to you know get you water no one needs to order an uber for you no one needs to hold you up or hold your hair up as you're vomiting no you're doing stuff as an adult you're doing stuff well you're doing stuff with fucking some level of um you know balance you're not going too crazy and if it does get too much you take your ass home by yourself and you don't fucking you know um lampoon yourself and other people so they can look after you it's not fucking fair so when i see articles like this I really am aware that this is true. The The title says, ban GSB at raves is dangerous. And I really do agree because I think in general, this police nanny state thing going on where we're going to be policing what people take and this is okay, but that is, but that, but that isn't, is fucking lame. So let's see what this person writes in this particular article. It says, I slipped out of the store in a dimly lit basement uh, bathroom in Brooklyn. Soul food restaurant sliding a frosted glass dropper bottle and chubby three milliliter pink syringe into my friend's hand as he quickly replaced me. My mouth burned, a sore burning to develop in the side of my tongue. I had just dropped, uh, so I just squirted a dose of G, like a combination of GHB and its more potent precursor, GBL, into my mouth without the usual water or 7-Up chaser. GHB, GBL are central nervous system depressants, like alcohol and produce an alcohol-like intoxication. Is that what the high is like? Alcohol-like? Huh. 
GHB is a chemical that occurs naturally in the human brain, while GBL is an industrial chemical that can be manually or metabolically converted into GHB or GBH. Right? Gave his body harm. In the US, GHB tends to be more common, while GBL is in a bigger in Europe. G as both chemical are colloquially known is usually dissolved in water, sold as a clear liquid, and usually consumed orally. Yeah, I remember seeing people take it. Like, the first time I saw someone take it was when I went into the bathroom stall of Berghain with this group of lovely gay dudes, and they were passing it around each other, and I was like, nah, I'm good. And they basically filled a little bit into a cup, into the lid of the water bottle, um, and then they just took that swig and continued going on. So I'm assuming that's how it gets done. Um, I'm just weirdly, I see people also doing it as syringes. I don't know how people, how do people get fucking syringes into nightclubs? Like, how do you get a whole fucking syringe into a nightclub? Considering how they search you and stuff, getting a whole syringe into a nightclub is fucking wild. Um, but anyway, let's continue. I wasn't able to sip it slowly like I usually do. Neither was my friend. That's because we were at the popular New York City rave in mid-January called Unter which has a harsh anti-G policy. A sign with a big slash GHB was taped on a cloak check, commanding partygoers to keep GHB and GLBL out and claiming that GHB is actively harming the greater dance music communities. Oh, so GHB is an issue also in the States. I thought it was just a, a, an issue here in Europe. So I guess in the gay scene and the queer scene all around the world, um, people are having issues with GHB. Um, data and G-related harms among New Yorkers is scarce. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has not been able to comment by the time of publication. But in London, fatal G overdoses and G-involved sexual assaults have been shown to be widespread. More than a quarter of mostly British gay men reported that they were that they knew somebody who had died from a G overdose. Jesus Christ! Mostly British gay men reported that they knew someone who died from a GHB overdose fuck the same proportion said that they had been subjected to sexual assault while on g found buzzfeed news uk and the unfortunate thing is nobody gives a fuck about male sexual assault whether it's a woman or whether it's another man involved no one gives a fuck so the statistics on this probably are really skewed because most guys probably don't even report it you know how guys are you always keep us suppressed and shit and just generally people don't give a fuck but i'm surprised that g has been used as a sexual assault thing because i always assumed um they always used to say that the sexual assault that people used to use was what ketamine or something right it was ket i didn't know they used g also but i remember that it was used to think because i think that's what they do in you in it is it you the show that crystal Leo was on the diddler didn't the guy in you use ketamine i think that's what they use right or something so i didn't know it was also g that was a thing that they use in sexual assault so that's fucking horrendous man um the one thing the thing about g that gets you that that people like the fact that you are kind of you know you it, it's a disassociative and you become like a bit spacey is also one of the reasons why people like to use it to doing a sexual assault because you are not you know in control of your functions and shit um wanting to prevent g related harms is admirable unfortunately i'm not sure that it's what Anta's policy is doing i rushed my i rushed my dose in an unlit stall because i wanted to stay at the party exactly trans girls like myself and my friend get in for free and the music is good i didn't want to face the punitive consequences of the signed promise possession or use of ghb at unter will result in being banned the last word was extra big just in case we didn't get the message my friend stepped out of the stool with a big grin on her face. How much did you do, I asked. Curious, in the past, I had measured her dose. Um, two millimeters, I think. I'm not quite sure. When using G, knowing your exact dose is key to having a good time. Half a milliliter, too much, often seems to be the difference between a warm, fuzzy feeling akin to alcohol or molly and the deathly slow breathing of an overdose. From what I realized, reading online, people do g if i'm not mistaken as well because it hasn't got severe hangover um things you can actually be quite refreshed in the morning especially if you don't drink which you're not meant to drink with it that's what that's what i read is all people saying that they like to do g because of that so yes the feeling is warm and fuzzy like a good alcohol buzz or whatnot but more so because the hangovers aren't as harsh as other drugs um it continues in times past i shared tips and tricks for safer g use with my friend 
First shake the dropper, since G tends to otherwise settle at the bottom, making final doses extra potent. Draw up an exact amount, probably for my friend at least, 1 or 1.5 millimeters. Only redose after 2 hours with half of the amount of the previous dose. Never mix alcohol or ketamine. Maybe some of the information slipped to my mind. Okay, that's that's the interesting part of it, right? I think, for me personally, I think any drug that requires this amount of effort, this amount of foresight, this amount of planning, I'm probably not going to do it, you know? That's why I've got absolutely no interest in trying it whatsoever. Zero whatsoever. I'm a bit stuck in my ways, but I've got no interest. All of this shit to remember. The do like It's like when you go on fucking... Um, if you go like on a Reddit, like if you go on the EDM Reddit, you'll see the kids there because the EDM Reddit, especially most of the kids over there are like from, from America and stuff and they take Molly really serious. They'll have like a party pack. There's like a pre-planning before you take it. They'll do the dosage of Molly based on your height and your body size and your body mass index and shit, right? Um, they'll they'll take it at a specific time. They'll time it and have timers on their phone. They'll know what to eat during the day, what to drink, what to, what to do after. It's really too much for me personally. All that planning just for like a couple of nights. It's not that deep. So when it goes to those... When it gets to this sort of like scientific level in terms of having fun, I'm out. You know what I mean? It's too much. I'd rather, you know, have a whiskey and coke and just fucking dance on the dance floor, do a little bit of whistling and get on my bike. It's not that deep really. I don't need to do all this stuff. Maybe some of the information set my mind. Um, after all, I just wanted to take it in and out. The bathroom done detected. 30 minutes later when the G hit, my friend began to feel nauseous. I think I need to sit down, she told me. She eventually <laughs> she eventually vomited in a trash can on the side of the dance floor. I looked around to see if anybody had noticed. I went to see uh, I went to get her some water. They were uh, they were only selling it. Nothing was free. So you do G, you take too much, you end up vomiting in the trash can, you need some water to clear your head to get you fucking hydrated and you can't get some free water because they only sell it. Great. The nausea luckily ended up being a full extent of the um, excessive of, uh, dosing harm, but it could have ended much worse. I also love us ravers, right? You're happy to buy drugs for like 50 euros, 50, 100 pounds plus, but in a moment somebody says you have to pay for water, suddenly you're like, oh, I can't buy, I can't buy that. It's too much. It's like, come on, bro. You just spent fucking 500 quid on fucking drugs. Like, you can't just buy a bottle of water. Fucking crazy. The harms posed by G-Bands. It's unclear how many people, if any, have been barred from UNTA and its new sister party, Large Marge, as a result of the event's anti-G policy. But in my experience, the policy doesn't stop the use. Instead, it inspires the fear of being humiliated and kicked out, driving riskier, rushed use of the drug that requires precise dosing. That's true, because the same thing happens here in the UK with drinking laws. Our licensing laws in the UK are fucking R-worded. Some places in the UK, especially outside of London, you can't go to a bar or a club after the hours of like 2 a.m. So what will happen is like these local pubs in those towns, those small towns, will have drink deals from like 5 to like 8 or 9 or whatnot, right? To get people in the pubs sooner and get them drinking more. So they'll have, I don't know, um, two for one pints, a half price on cocktails, whatever it may be. Then that pub will unfortunately close at like 11 p.m., maybe 10 p.m. Those people are buzzed and looking for a good time. They'll go to their local nightclub that's also got some drink deals on, especially early between the hours of 10 to 12 because they want to get those people to come in, not go home and go straight from the pub to their club. So then by the time those guys leave that nightclub at 2 a.m. from a, a day full of drinking from 5 to 2 where they've been just shoved, you know, this kind of drink down their throat because of the fucking limited hours of opening, they are steaming, which is why people, when they stumble out of these fucking clubs at 2 a.m. in the morning, which is way too early, especially if you've been drinking between 5 without eating, they are steaming and they're ready to fight. They're ready to cause a ruckus, piss on people's walls and shit, shit everywhere. That's why it gets crazy because the licensing laws are too strict. They're not open enough. They need to be more broad so you can maybe drink in bars and clubs for like a prolonged period of time so that people are coming out drips and drabs. You're not having everybody rush out at the same time. That's also a bit of an issue at clubs. All the clubs, especially clubs in like, you know, Liverpool Street Station and Shoreditch, that whole strip, they all rush out at the same time because the clubs all close at 4 a.m. Loads of antisocial behavior, loads of police presence. That means obviously the tax Players like myself have to pay more money to have those people on the streets. It's fucking annoying. It really is. So all of those laws they put in place to limit drinking doesn't do shit. It's like the it's like the smoking ban. All my friends that smoke still smoke. 
yes, they have to go outside to smoke, but they all just it's become an uh, it's become a culture amongst itself now. That's now become a thing. Going outside to get some fresh air and have a smoke, do some people watching. So that whole smoking ban. Oh, you're not going to smoke inside. Okay, cool. We just go outside then. It doesn't stop anything. If you want to do it, you're going to do it anyway. So if you, if you let them do it, make them do it in a safe environment. That's what I think. Um, it continues. The policy could also impact how people respond when something goes wrong. Under a ban for life threat, you are less likely to call an ambulance or a friend or to alert the security team. Exactly. We see that people try to hide the situation and deal with it themselves in what can be cas in what be can be cases of life and death. And I've definitely seen this. I've seen this, in, especially when I went to Berlin. I saw many people just get chucked out of the nightclub if they were if they looked like they were spiked, or if they looked like they took too much, if they looked like they got too fucked up or whatever. They just chucked them out. Like, hey, we don't want you in our club. Don't die here. Die outside. <laughs> I saw it happen so many times. I was like, whoa. And I was like, okay, cool, fair play. Which I get because, you know, if you're a responsible adult and you're going out, you should be responsible for yourself. You shouldn't put that responsibility on the nightclub to look after you. They should obviously provide you a space that's quote unquote safe for you to dance and have a good time. But you should also look after yourself. That doesn't mean leaving your cup and turning your back to your fucking glass and talking to a fucking stranger, right? Keeping your eye on your drinks and, you know, making sure you only take the stuff that you brought with you or maybe the only people that you trust. All that stuff is important. But the brutality that I saw with these bars and these clubs, security, chucking people out in the streets because they took too much and they didn't want to die inside their clubs was fucking hilarious, man. I'm not going to lie. It continues. Um, Ines Macedo and Marina Cunha of Cos was that of Cosmicare, a Portuguese harm reduction um, organization, told um, Filter. If we look at the case reports of GBO and GHB deaths, we see that almost all happened when mixing G with other drugs or while sleeping it out. Oh, okay. So it's not actually G that's the problem. It's when you do a lot of it and you mix with other shit. Isn't that the same with all drugs? If you do too much or you mix it, it's always going to lead to fatal things. Unless it's obviously it's been cut. Because that's one thing we don't have an issue with in Europe. We don't really have the fentanyl issue that you guys have, right? So it's not that, you know, it's not as bad as it probably could be. But this explains quite a lot. This makes so much sense here. Um, so the, the deaths, we see that almost all kind of mixing it, but both very common responses to avoid tipping off the organizers to use of G. The policy does not seem to be having its intended effect. Anecdotally, other attendees are still using the sedative, the sedative. At large marge held in January 18th, one raver chatted openly with me about how he and his friends were currently Ging out. So were many of the friends. So, so this band they have at this club and these, these parties doesn't work. The same seems to go for other parties and contexts. If I like G, I'll go to a sauna. I will find a way. They do G in saunas. Yo, gay guys get it in, and it? The people in the queer scene, they have fun, boy. Gay guys have fun. Imagine tripping out in a fucking sauna while getting your little your little minka sucked and shit. <laughs> getting your little chiggly do toked and tugged while you're fucking rolling on the on the old D R U G S. Crazy. If I like G um and I go to a sauna, I'll find a way. London based um chem sex harm reductionist Ignacio Labayen de Inza told me of establishments with strict no G policies two or three years ago they would check but you could see people passing out Sever Graniek, the organizer of Unter and Large Marge, declined Filter's request to comment for the story, but the origin of Unter's policy seems rooted in a legacy of queer rave culture. In Berlin, GHB is a fucking no-no, and they kicked you out if you get exposed, caught with it, or caught overdosing, wrote on Reddit. That's the thing, though. It's a big no-no, but everyone does it. It's a big open secret. But I guess now, because it's got such a bad reputation, everyone's just not talking about it. They'd rather just do it, you know, in silence. Um, yeah, G G is GBL. It's, it's uh, I think I've said it here on the article. It says here G is this um, uh, rodeo. G is what do they call it? Actually, the term. Uh, let's scroll up here. What does it say? Uh, 
it's a G A G H B R nerve our central nervous d d system depressants like alcohol produce an alcohol like intoxication GHB is a chemical that occurs naturally in the human brain while GBL is an industrial chemical that can be manually or metabolically converted into GHB in the US GHB tends to be more common while GBL is a bigger in Europe and G as both chemicals and colloquially known is usually dissolved in water and sold in clear liquid and consumed orally oral consuming no pause. I heard that they had a few years ago, someone had died right in the club from mixing G and alcohol. It seems they assume people with G either can't use it sensibly and will fuck themselves up or that they will use it nefariously and spike somebody's drink. A different Reddit user about Bergheim, the world's most famous club. The legendary club um, has allegedly responded to club goers um, intoxicated on G with violence, a medium writer claimed in 2018. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, Anti-G sentiment has been alive and well for some time in Western Europe. A 2009 London party warned keep GHB and GBR at clubs. A 2010 Berlin event commanded do not give GHB. Take care of yourself, your friends and others. According to Google Translate, another Berlin party started in 2017. No GHB. The dominant attitude of rave organizers regarding GBL use is prohibition. Is a uh, yeah prohibitionism, and Portugal is following this general tendency. In Lisbon, one of the most well-known clubs has a Pacific Materials advertising G usage since 2018 and other queer clubs. Ravers describe harsh practices from staff in situations involving G. Hunter's GHB policy seemed to first be introduced in October 2018. So, yeah, it doesn't work, basically. Everyone still does it. Everyone still takes it. Um, these laws are fucking crazy. These laws are fucking crazy. But yeah, like I said before, I just would rather... We live in a world where everybody has some level of responsibility when they're doing whatever they want to do. Um, whether it's staying up late to play video games, whether it's fucking gambling, whether it's drinking alcohol, doing drugs, whatever your fucking vice is, whatever the thing that is that you do that occupies a lot of your time or your free time, do it somewhat responsibly and don't be a burden on other people. There needs to be more conversations around grown-ups acting like grown-ups and not fucking acting like children when they do certain things. And then basically harming and destroying everyone else's good time that's not fucking fair and i think when it comes to drugs there is no hierarchy there is no fucking snobbery involved in drug taking all drugs are bad fundamentally all drugs are bad that includes alcohol that includes fucking cigarettes it's all bad it's all fucking bad if you want to live a prosperous good life you should probably not do anything and go to church but if you are going to do it have some balance and do them well that's basically the, the 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 long and short of it. It shouldn't be like, a, oh, because I do Molly, uh, crystal meth is is beneath me. It's like, bro, it's all fucking horrible. It's all chemicals. It's all man made shit. It's all fucking toxins you put in your body. It's all harmful. It's all damaging your brain, your vital organs. Right? It's shortening your fucking lifespan. It's not good. All of it is terrible. So if that's the case, do it responsibly or don't do it at all. That's my advocacy in this sort of thing, personally. But again what do i bloody know absolutely nothing because i am a big fat redact anyway moving on um let's talk about the nike previewed shoes that just have dropped here courtesy of complex right so nike used to do this before i don't know why they stopped but this was a thing that happened a lot back in the day but i guess maybe now with um forum culture basically dead and buried there's not really a central place to see leaked images or even official images of up and coming shoes because i remember before you'd see people that worked in stores people that were buyers people that were agents people that just working in the industry would share little line sheet vi images of like oh here's what adas has got planned here's new balance's new thing i went to the showroom here's a picture you don't get that inf shit anymore really to be honest now you get maybe leak now you get maybe rep companies or rep factories in china who get shoes early to copy they might leak stuff or maybe these professional leakers but you don't really get a lot of that kind of industry inside the stuff and there's no real central place to find it so it is what it is 
Nike, I guess, are doing their own type of promotion and heads up with these official images that they provided to Complex uh, regarding sneakers, uh, shoes that are going to be coming out on sneakers soon, right? And the article says as follows here, um, Nike just previewed tons of sneakers dropping in 2024. Um, it says every so often, every sneaker brand tries to get ahead of the leakers by unveiling some of the upcoming releases. The latest example is of this, Nike's first ever sneakers showcase event today where the brand revealed upcoming releases that were arriving throughout 2024. I actually prefer these. I don't mind. I don't, I don't actually don't. I, st I don't mind both approaches. I don't mind leaker stuff. And I also don't mind the official stuff. Like, give me the leaks of some fat dude holding a fucking new pair of Air Max is about to drop. But also, I want to see this sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? I actually don't mind Nike deciding, hey, we're going to take official pictures so that you can have an idea on what we're dropping and that you can see it lit up properly lace properly all that good stuff i don't really mind this stuff to be fair the only thing i don't like is that they don't lace it properly look they don't relace the shoes that's a fucking really big faux pas so let's scroll down and see what we got here first we got a women's ah oh, this is fucking annoying it's a women's it's not a men's so the women's air max 186 with a big window that's an 86 right it's going to be releasing that royal blue colorway but it's a women's only that's fucking annoying that's such a legendary and beautiful color. And of course, the big window, the massive airbag, that's what they've done to kind of, um, this is obviously a nod to the original sketches of the Air Max 1 that Tinker Hatfield um, designed back in the day. Obviously, 1986 had a much bigger airbag or no, had a much bigger window. I think the airbag's still the same, but the window was a bit bigger. And if I'm not mistaken, the reason why they stopped doing it is because over time, the polyurethane would crumble or the air bubbles themselves would pop, if I'm not mistaken. I think the popping was mostly to do with Air Max 95s. They pumped them up too much. That's why they deflated them and then encased them in the fucking midsole so they kind of aren't as protruding, which is annoying. That's why if you buy um air max 95s vintage ones from like the early 2000s you'll see that they have really exaggerated bulbous airbags because you know they were made to look really crazy and kind of exaggerated but nowadays they kind of look a bit tame but these air max ones look fucking beautiful in a royal blue but it's annoying that they're only women's hopefully this is a typo and maybe there will be a men's release also but it says only women's there then continuing on, we've got the return of the Air Max 180. Oh, I love these shoes. These are very underrated Air Max. Um, a bit of a, you know, a bit of a slivet shape, a bit more of a sock feel. Um, they don't really look the greatest with jeans. I don't think so. They probably would suit wearing kind of shorts and whatnot. But I always love the Air Max um, 180. Um, I love how the airbag is basically exposed underneath here. You have like the air unit here and basically some tread underneath. It's not kind of encased. I kind of like that clear thing and when you flip them underneath you kind of can see the air bubble there so air max 80s are one of my favorite pairs to be honest air maxes um we've got them in the classic ultramarine colorway fucking perfect i'm definitely gonna get a pair of these these look fucking beautiful um you've also got an air sneaker an air what an air sndr max highlight green i've never been a fan of the the air, the nikes with the zips to be honest these came out i'm gonna be assuming late 90s early 2000s um it's kind of come back into vogue now because of that whole y2k trend these look very y2k ish right wear these with a pair of oakley's and stuff you're gonna be swagging it out and usually they would have laces underneath this zip but i've just never been a fan of this type of silhouette or shoe it's a pass for me don't really care um the footscape wovens absolutely beautiful this is a quintessential sneakerhead sneaker shoe um i think made popular more so by the you know our japanese and other extended asian man them they're the ones that really put the fucking footscape woven on the fucking map and then i think europeans took it and ran with it with the big pin rolls and um, wearing these together absolutely look brilliant i love those we've got an air terra humara which i'm a big fan of again not lovely shoe if i'm not mistaken um, this Humara, they're actually going to do a collaboration with Undefeated happening soon. So these are going to be looking great. I actually love these. Really good model. Um, actually, I'd prefer to wear these over a pair of Salomons. They're a bit, you know, a little bit um, different to wearing Salomons in terms of shape, but they kind of do the same thing. Of course, if they were to bring out a pair that had Gore-Tex and shit, I'd be all over them, but definitely like that model. We've got Pegasus Wave in black. Oh, I love these. I'm not really too familiar with the model, the Pegasus Wave, but I actually like the look of these. You also got the Pegasus 2K5 in this white and grand and grand and gradient colorway. Maybe I'll take that over the black one, actually. This is probably a better colorway. These look incredible, isn't it? I love these. Wow. I haven't actually heard of this model before, to be honest. But these look really cool. Um, then we've got a Pegasus 2K5 again in the various colorways. So you've got, oh, that white colorway here is really nice. 
This is a vintage Pegasus. That is really beautiful. That white colorway is fucking gorgeous. I wonder if we're going to see somebody do a, a collaboration with these fashion brands because these look really good. That white and red colorway is awesome, um, as is this pink one. And also this black and yellow one too. These are probably my, my favorite colorways. This, this one here at the top, the white and pink, and this kind of yellow, gray, and black as well. These are probably two of my favorites. The blue and the white and black ones are not really for me, but those three are really nice. I like them. Um, we've got a clog posit. Oh, awful. I fucking hate, hate, hate that model anyway, right? The posit, the phone posits, whatever. I fucking hate them. They're big in New York. Um, American sneakerheads fucking love them, but I absolutely hate them, right? They're so fucking ugly. And they're making them in clogs. Like, no thank you. I'll pass on them. But I think all the fashion girlies are going to like them, to be fair. But no thank you. You've got an ACG Rufus. Oh, I love the look of these, actually. It looks like a, it looks like an Air Mock, right? It looks like an Air Mock. One of my favorite shoes, right? Nike Air or Nike Mock ACG. It looks like one of my favorite fucking shoes ever but it's been given a fatter sole that looks like right you see the the, the the fucking mock that if i'm not mistaken was modeled after a fucking potato which is hilarious but it's also an, a really good you know all-terrain shoe for the hiking and whatnot and for the bouldering mandem out there i always fucking love mocks i need to actually get another new pair of them but they actually look like a mock with a fucking thicker sole and obviously done in a clog shape i really love them i'm not too mad at these you've got an acg izzy in black it looks like, oh, so that looks like the same model. So that is a Rufus. And the Izzy is the same shoe, but it's been made in like a more of a trainer with like a zip on it. So more like a mid cut, like a chucker. Eh. I think I prefer actually this this model more, to be fair. This HG Rufus is probably the better model, there, especially in that green, almost dark green olive colorway. And this nice leather um, seam trim here on the top is really beautiful. I'm not going to lie. We've also got this ATG Explorade. Not for me, but... Oh, actually, no. I like that. I just saw this um, faux carbon fiber trim here on the midsole. I like these. They've got another colorway of these. I fucking like these, actually. These are really nice. I'm not too mad at these at all. You've got an ATG Mountain Fly Low GTX Phantom. That's a fucking mouthful. Not really for me, personally. Oh, one of my favorites. Oh, these are hard. ACG Tora Mid. This is this is right up my alley, right up my alley. The only thing I would say as a fucking as a edit on these boots, I love the plush suede or nubuck on the upper. I love that the this isn't even a mesh. It feels like it looks like canvas. I love the rope laces, right? ACG feel or there are ACGs. One thing I think I would edit if I could do it, I'd actually get them resold. I don't like the sole. The sole's a bit too thin for me. The sole's a bit too light in the ass. I might want to resole this and have the midsole uh, be a, maybe a couple of inches, a couple of millimeters bigger, and then maybe have a thicker tread on the outsole. Maybe a vibrant something. I might. That's what I would probably do. Maybe I'd, I'd resole them a bit, make them look a little bit chunkier as a sole watch, sole unit to match the upper. But I do like that boot. That's really fucking nice. HGG Torre Mid. Um, we've got an SB Dunk Low. Again, I'm, I'm bored of dunks. Dunks can get fucked next year. Please, no more dunks for me. I'm fucking bored of that silhouette. We've got SBD, SB Dunk Low City of Love. Again, don't give a fuck. We've got another one, City of Love, in another colorway. Don't care. Um, then we've got... Uh, oh, these are great. LD100, LD1000 SPs. So good. This, these remind me of... Um, didn't they do this as a collaboration with Junior Watanabe, if I'm not mistaken? uh junior watanabe nike ld 1000 i'm pretty sure there was a nike lds done by junior watanabe com de garso times back in the day yeah there we go i knew it. i knew i was right see my references i fucking knew it i knew it bro i knew it uh Oh, it's going to show an image, right? Let me show you the picture of it so you can see. But these came out, I think, in the early 2000s. And they were vintage distressed style with, like, the stained midsole, the scuffed uppers, the dyed laces. Like, these were fucking awesome when they dropped, man. Just a shame I've got my feet are so fat and wide that you see all my toes protruding at the front when I'm trying to wear them. But these are such a good shoe, such a good model in the various colorways. This purple colorway is fucking beautiful, right? This waffle, these are these came out a while ago. These are done by, again, a collaboration with Junior. I'm pretty sure there was a Junior collaboration with them as well. 
um, that came out. I'm pretty sure if I'm mistaken, but he's an early 2000s. Yeah, there you go. See, you see the junior label there, don't you? You can see the Com de Garçon label there, Junior Watanabe on the inside there, Junior Watanabe, Nike, whatever it may be. Let's continue there. Um, you've also got an air, a foam posit eggplant. Oh, that colorway is going to be popular. That That's the classic colorway everybody likes. I actually don't mind the foam posits, to be fair, in the actual colorway. That fucking um, eggplant original colorway is fucking beautiful. They look really good in shorts. I'm not too sure if they're going to look good in my size 11 feet, but they look not too bad. You also got a foam posit in Royal. Oh, these are gonna, these are gonna, these are gonna fucking break sneakers. American fucking sneakerheads love foam posits, man. Especially guys from New York, they fucking love foam posits. They love foam posits probably more than they love Jordan Elevens. <laughs> they fucking love foam posits, so those are gonna do great. You got a Dunklo um Co. JP reverse curry colorway. Don't care about Dunklos again. This this is a really um legendary colorway actually. The silver and blue Dunklo. These are gonna do really well as well. People are gonna be all over them. Also, the, oh, wow, the reverse Ultraman colorway. If these came out in the Dunk High, I'd be all over them. That's actually a lovely colorway. That gray and red is fucking beautiful, to be fair. I'm not going to lie. And then that's about it. But yeah, new updates for sneakers coming soon. And I think we've got a last couple of pictures here from people um, regarding the ones that I want, which are these ACG boots. They come in that brown colorway. That one I showed you before with the brown and the dark green. And then we've also got Mac Attacks happening soon as well. Mac attacks in that white, in that leather white with a yellow. I'm all for these as well. I'm all over them. They look really fucking good. The Mac attacks look fucking awesome, actually. I'm not, I'm not mad at the Mac attacks in the slightest. I'm not mad at the Mac attacks in the absolute slightest. So big up those when they eventually do end up dropping. Big up those. See if I can kind of load on there. Come on. Can you load for me? Can you load for me? Let's see the Mac attacks load for me. Bear with me a second as I get them to load. Is it going to load? There we go. Yeah, Mac attacks there in that white and yellow. They look really good there. That's a fucking nice fucking shoe. I'm not mad at that in the slightest. I'm not mad at that in the absolute slightest. So yeah, big up the Mac attacks. Love them. Absolutely love them. Anyway, my friends, that has been the Agassino Zynga Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. For those of you who've tuned in and liked the stream, who've, who, those of you who tuned in live and enjoyed the podcast, please make sure you like the stream. Let me know your appreciation down below by liking the stream. For those of you wanting to listen to random show stuff, I'll be back again later tonight. So keep an eye out for that. Later tonight, random show going over some stuff I basically missed on. So keep an eye out for that one. My patrons also there available. I'm just at the moment exporting the reaction that I did to Matt Rife special. So if you want to see my my Matt Rife special reaction, then make sure you sign up to the Patreon. It's only $1 per month there. Entry fee to get involved. And again, I'm only doing it because eBay, sorry, eBay. Um, YouTube is flipping lame and won't let you react to stuff. You know, it'll fucking demonetize my entire channel and get it blocked. So if you want to see my reaction to the Matt Rife special, please make sure you sign up to my Patreon. Patreon.com for slash Agostino. You can find the link in the description. But apart from that, thank you for tuning in. Pleasure as always to have you here. If you listen to the podcast via the audio side of things, you shall hear my tune of the day under my voice right now. Of course, if you're listening via the podcast apps, whatever you're using, please make sure you also, if you can, Leave me a five-star review on whatever platform you're using. That'd be greatly appreciated. But until next time, my friends, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you all again very soon. Take care. Peace.